something? I said we, we can wait two or three minutes because there are people joining. That's all good. I've emailed 75 people, so... <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, they all saw my name on their Eva and they're not going to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would turn up just out of curiosity because this, you know, person may be some kind of obscure professor in Princeton that no one has ever seen before and they have something <laughs> really important to impart to the world. Oh, so. gosh, if only. <laughs> you never know, do you? You never know, that's right. We weren't obligated to have a PowerPoint, were we? No, no. Okay, cool. All right. Scott, is that your dog there? Yeah. There yes. Uh, he's a little, um, he's a bit of an attention seeker, so he always insists upon being on my lap. But, you know, it's not a big deal if you're going to a conference to present in person, but uh, <laughs> at home teaching and uh, attending conferences can be a little problematic. <laughs> well, I did say it's pets included. <laughs> That's why I left my dog outside <laughs> <laughs> until I presented at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, he doesn't actually make too much noise. He just tries to jump up. Yeah, it gets in the way. Yeah, so I may have to banish him outside if he misbehaves. I try to keep my audio off until it's my turn to present. <laughs> Don't you worry, it's all good. Maybe we should start, Eva. Yes. Hello to everybody. I'm George Arabajis. I'm a professor here at the University of Athens and one of the organizers. We are going to start right away because uh, today we must stick to the program. Uh, Eva just inform us about that. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. You know all that in an online conference we really must be strict with the schedule. We decided to have only 10 minutes, not because we want to be punitive, but because we want to invite discussion. And that's why we shared our papers in advance in the Dropbox to, to have as many arguments as possible during uh, answer and you know, Q and A, the Q and A session. So please stick to your 10 minutes. You want people to talk to you rather than you talking at them. And with that, I have nothing more to add. We can go straight to it. Okay, probably should start. Uh, now, with... Our first speaker today is Anne uh, Dickman uh, from the University of New England, and she will be talking to us about platonic influences in the testament of Job. We look very forward to that. Off you go, Amber. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes okay. Hi. Good. Awesome. Good evening. Um, 
I am very yeah. honored to be here, firstly, among so many great minds. And thank you so much to Eva and George and all the other people for putting this on. It's been amazing. I apologize. I have no PowerPoint for you, but I will try to make up for that by speaking in a very animated voice. So you can hopefully follow my argument and find it as intriguing as I do. As you know, it's very hard to make any kind of advanced argument in 10 to 15 minutes. I've included much more detail in the paper that I, that I have uploaded. However, that is also far from complete. My intention here is to draw attention to literary echoes of the Platonic corpus within the Hellenistic text of the Testament of Job, this text being the focal point of my current PhD research. I'm not a philosopher. I would describe myself more as an historian of ideas, and I'm fascinated by the merging and evolving of ideas that began in the Hellenistic world and influenced Judaism and then a burgeoning Christianity, which of course has in turn impacted both Eastern and Western culture right up until our own day. Within the text of the Testament of Job, I believe I can see strong Platonist ideas and echoes of the Platonic writings, which have made their way into Christian thinking and still made their impact felt in our own time. So very quickly, the Testament of Job, which I'll call T. Job, to keep it short, is considered by most scholars to be a Hellenistic Jewish work whose date cannot be determined any more precisely than sometime between the first century BCE and the first century CE. Despite much debate regarding its provenance and authorship, the majority consensus among scholars is that T. Job is of Jewish authorship and that its original language was Greek. The story itself is based upon the book of Job found in the canon of the Old Testament, but with very significant differences. Whilst the themes of the Hebrew tale of Job center around issues of innocent suffering, justice and theodicy, the themes of T. Job revolve around patient endurance, the difference between the earthly and heavenly realms and immortality of the soul. It's clear to see, even upon a cursory reading of this text, that it is very much a part of the Greek world and that the author is familiar with philosophical ideas. Indeed, I believe that the Hellenistic philosophy found within its pages is one of the distinguishing characteristics that sets it apart from its earlier Hebrew forebear. One of these ideas, which is used very prominently within T. Job, is that of the athletic metaphor, which is used to describe the battle between Satan and Job. The athletic metaphor is used much in Greek philosophy, even before the time of Plato. So although this does not prove either Platonic or Platonist influence, it certainly shows a familiarity with Greek philosophical language. There is, however, another theme within T. Job that could be a very strong indicator of Platonist influence, and that is Job's description of the changeable and unchangeable realms, which resonates strongly with Plato's theory of forms. This theme is discussed in detail in a section of dialogue between Job and his three kingly friends. Interestingly, Job is almost a Socratic figure in this scene as he calls out his friends for their attempts to confound him with their supposed logic and their inability to see the truth. When Job's three kingly friends come to comfort him, they sing a lament of Job's former riches with the repeated refrain, where is the splendor of his throne? When Job finally replies, he says to them, be silent, and now I will show you my throne and the splendor of its majesty, which is among the holy ones. My throne is in the super terrestrial realm and its splendor and majesty are from the right hand of the father in the heavens. My throne is eternal. The whole world shall pass away and its splendor shall fade and those who cling to it shall be caught in its demise. But my throne is in the holy land and its splendor is in the unchangeable world. These kings will pass away and these rulers are passing away and their splendor and boast will be as in a mirror. But my kingdom is forever and ever and its splendor and majesty are in the chariots of the father. Now Job clearly states here that there is another realm that is unchanging and that his true throne is in that realm. He also makes the statement that everything that we see here on this earth will pass away and that it is only a reflection. In the conversation that follows between Job and his friends, they are concerned that perhaps he has lost his mind due to his suffering. And his friend Bildad asks of him, is your mind in a stable condition? Job replies, my mind is not concerned with earthly things since the earth and those who dwell in it are not stable. But my mind is concerned with heavenly things where there is no instability. This conversation strongly resonates with the platonic view that only the intelligible can be known. At the very beginning of the narrative of T. Job, Job asks what is true and how he can know it. 
The truth is then revealed to him and he realizes that it does not lie in the things that he can see, but in the things which he cannot see. Job acquires knowledge of what Plato would call the self mover, first principle or the supreme being, but which for Job comes as knowledge of the true God. This revelation is intelligible and not perceptible and therefore is the truth for only the forms can be known. This idea is clearly shown when Bildad asks Job where he places his hope and Job responds by saying in the living God. Bildad then asks Job who has afflicted him with his present suffering and Job again replies God. Bildad then challenges him by attempting to logically argue that God would not treat a faithful follower this way, just as no king would punish a soldier who had served him well. Job replies, I have my wits about me and there is understanding in my heart. Why then should I not talk about the great things of the Lord? Should my mouth completely blunder respecting my master? Though his friends are using what appears to be sound logic, Job responds that he cannot err in what he says about God. For Job, God represents being or the unity of all forms. The earth that he perceives and lives within is changeable. He looks to a higher realm, which is unchangeable. The forms are perfect and unchangeable. And for Job, God represents these. Therefore, when he speaks of God, he cannot err for he is truth. There also appears to be an intriguing echo of Plato's famous allegory of the cave in this narrative. After the unchangeable realm is revealed to Job, he seeks to live a life that reflects his new understanding of the truth and destroys the place of Satan, which is seducing and leading people astray from this higher knowledge that he has received. This endeavor is transformed into an epic battle where Job loses everything of any earthly value. Yet Job has this to say after everything he owned was destroyed, including his children. And I became as one who wishes to enter a certain city to see its wealth and obtain a portion of its splendor. And when he embarks with cargo in a seagoing ship and at mid ocean sees the surging water and the opposition of the winds, he throws the cargo into the sea saying, I am willing for everything to be lost solely to enter this city so that I might obtain the things more valuable than the discarded objects and the ship. Thus, I also now considered my possessions as nothing compared to approaching the city about which the angel had spoken to me. Compare this passage from Plato's Republic. And as he remembered the place he lived in first, what counted as wisdom there and his former fellow prisoners, don't you think he would call himself happy for his change of residence and pity the others? Do you think our man would miss these rewards and envy anyone honored by the prisoners or holding princely power among them? Or would he rather react, as Homer describes it, by much preferring to work the fields above for someone else, a serf to a man with nothing, or endure any fate rather than believe as they do and live like them? Now, the friend's discussion on Job's state of mind also strongly echoes Plato's description of the philosopher. Stand from the Phaedrus, standing aside from the busy doings of mankind and drawing nigh to the divine, he is rebuked by the multitude as being out of his wits for they know not that he is possessed by a deity. But inasmuch as he gazes upward like a bird and cares for nothing for the world beneath, men charge it upon him that he is demented. Now, one other theme that I want to draw attention to is the immortality of the soul in this text. So one of very stark contrasts between the older Hebrew version of Job and the narrative of T. Job is how the soul and afterlife is viewed. The book of Job maintains the older Jewish thinking that there is nothing after death but the shady existence of Hades or Sheol. It is emphasized that our life here on this earth is all that matters. This is not the case in T. Job and the immortality of the soul is a very strong theme, which is another example of the way in which Judaism had incorporated many of the concepts of the Greek world. Plato links the immortality of the soul with our apparent recollection of the forms and from the moment that Job has the truth revealed by the angel, a connection to his soul is made. Once he has seen and accepted the true being, he is told that his soul will be raised to heaven. At the end of the narrative, the story is finished from the perspective of Job's brother and we read, Job saw those who had come for his soul and rising immediately, he took a lyre and gave it to his daughter Himera and gave a censer to Cassia and gave a kettle drum to Amalthea Kera so they might praise those who had come for his soul. The one who sat in the great chariot came out and greeted Job, while the three daughters looked on and their father himself looked on, but others did not see. And taking the soul, he flew up while embracing it and made it mount the chariot and set off for the east.
In the Hebrew book of Job, Job's reward at the end of his suffering was only the physical restitution of his earthly wealth, the emphasis remaining on the belief that this life is all that we have. However, in T. Job, the immortality of the soul and the constant promise that Job will rise again is presented as the ultimate reward and prize. Because of this hope of rising to live with God in the unchangeable realm, Job is willing to endure any pain and suffering necessary in this life. It is unimportant. It is fading away. In conclusion, T. Job was written in Greek during the Hellenistic period, and therefore it is no surprise that it shows a strong understanding of Greek cultural and intellectual concepts. The presence of Hellenistic philosophy within this text is one of the major factors that set it apart so distinctly from its earlier Hebrew forebear. Based upon the observations made in this paper and the parallels made between concepts found within T. Job and the Platonic writings, I believe it is extremely plausible to suggest that a strong Platonist influence can be seen within this text. Based upon the approximate time of writing and the lack of any other explicit evidence, a direct link to Plato himself cannot be made. However, the concepts found within T. Job do resonate strongly with those of Platonism. This particular text became highly significant and influential for the early Christians and is quoted directly in a 5th century hagiographical work. Based on this observation, Platonic slash Platonist influence can be seen to extend far beyond this specific text and beyond the Hellenistic period itself. Thank you. Okay, we should proceed to questions now. Uh, last question, please. Yes, Mr. Ilyevsky. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Professor. And, and, and um, thank you also for the interesting, um, interesting presentation. Um, of course, I do <coughs> believe that um, Platonism has strong formative influence on, on, on Christianity, but maybe in, in, in order to act as a uh, Advocatus Diaboli, um, I would suggest that, well, the, the two world uh, ontology, the journey, um, analogies, and the yearning for the um, uh, other worlds, um, one may say that they are intrinsically uh, Christian ideas, not only Platonic. So why would we need to search for platonic influences on something that is seemingly intrinsically uh, Christian, as perhaps opposed to <clears throat> to Judaistic? So this would be one uh, question I would like to ask. And the other is maybe more of a s suggestion or uh, idea. I mean, it, it seems to me that the uh, undeterred resilience of Job um, and uh, this kind of a theodicy is more stoic than, than Platonic, like for example in Seneca's the 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 Providentia. Uh, so so yes. So uh, I would also like to hear your opinion on the second point. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, it is intrinsically Christian, but this is a Jewish work, and this is what's what's so intriguing about it. So this is pre-Christianity. Um, based as much as we can on the dates um, that we, yeah, that it's established as. So I suppose why I find it so interesting is that Christianity hasn't developed in a vacuum. You know, its ideas have had to come from somewhere. Um, I'm very interested in where, how all those ideas kind of merged in together. And I think Judaism was a lot more Hellenistic than is often recognized as. And so, you know, Christianity has taken on Judaism um, you know, well, the early Christians considered themselves Jews. Um, and so, you know, where have all these ideas come from? I actually think a lot of them came from an already Hellenized Judaism. So, I mean, for me, I just find that very intriguing to kind of trace those ideas. Um, the second one, I uh, totally I'm agree. Sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So this was a blunder on my part. Uh, maybe it's the, the online format I didn't get. I, I thought it was Hellenistic. But um, uh, Anno Domine uh, Hellenistic, and I, I didn't, I didn't get that it was a Jewish text. I, I thought it was a, a Christian text. So, so 
no Sorry, that's okay sorry. but it's it's still it's still a good question because like yeah with platonism influencing christianity so i think influenced it quite heavily i mean christianity has come out of a hellenistic world roman empire so i think its ideas have to they have to have crossed but yeah the second point the stoicism um i totally agree with you i think there is a lot there's another point i wanted to make i just didn't have time um asceticism is very very strong theme in this text job's suffering is intense like it's it's ridiculous um so it's and it's for 40 years it's he's sitting outside you know there's worms falling out of his body he's picking them up putting them back in his wounds and saying eat what god has given you so uh, the ascetic suffering is very strong um i also see some cynicism in there he he actually kind of resembles um quite the cynic sage at some points so there's just so much going on in this text that it's just it <laughs> continually blows my mind i suppose for this uh, for the purposes of this conference i was just drawing on the what i can see of the platonist views but you you're quite right there are some other philosophy yeah influences in there thank you There is time for another question, for a second question. Is, is Nikos there wanting to ask a question? Nico, I can see your hand. Yes, thank you. I, I hope I hope both of them yeah, have two hands. Anyway. Well, uh, <laughs> thanks, Eva. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Amber, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation and, your, and I'm convinced by the main point of your argument. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the part that you say that Job is a Socratic figure of sorts. And, um, simply a question of, of uh, based on my ignorance if i would like to search for a, a couple of christian authors that have been particularly influenced by t job where should i look for thank you mm, mm. that's a really really good question okay so i'm working on this in my actual phd thesis i found mm -hmm. a direct all right there's actually all right tertullian um directly quotes mm -hmm. um testament of job um it's also in the apocalypse of paul which is an anonymous okay. text thank you yes uh, it's also quoted directly in saint, saint simeon Starlight. Oh. yes thank you yes. antonius's there's three different lives of saint simeon the stylite mm -hmm. antonius's uh life Mm -hmm. basically doesn't and it, it's it's literally a parallel of job and simeon it's absolutely amazing he doesn't try okay. to hide it he specifically says like the blessed job and actually has the exact same story of the worms which is what drew oh. my attention in the first place happens to, to simeon the stylite he he picks up the okay. worms and puts them back in so yeah there are a few um that mention it i'm at the moment trying to find there's a lot of um implicit references to it but those are the direct ones that i can okay pull thank out you. Of my head. but if you'd like i can email you and give you everything that i've got i would love to thank you thank you so much Andrew. thank Again, you consolation. so we will go on the next speaker is uh yang liu zhang liu of the Sun Yat-sen University. And the topic is the Platonic tradition in Elegae of Rivoses, the anima. If you please take the floor. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, can I share my uh, PPT, uh, please? Is that possible to, uh, to share my presentation with you? Lou, we cannot yeah. hear you very well. Oh, sorry. You need to okay. speak up a little bit. Yeah, can you hear me now? Not uh, as well as we would like to. Oh, can you sorry, lower sorry. your camera so we can see you? Because we can't see. Ah, now it's a bit better. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I will detect my... Uh, my I will use the computer. Uh, can you, you hear me now? We can. Can we just ask you to speak up a little bit? Would you like yeah, to share your screen? Yes, I would like to share my screen with you. George, can you give yeah. rights to, to Lou? Uh, yes, I will do. Okay, it's done. Yeah, thank you. 
you only need to see at the bottom of the screen mute yeah. start oh, video yeah, share yeah. just click the I share button it. yeah screen that, that's okay i see it now can you see my screen now yes oh thank you yeah sorry for the delay i will try to finish my talk uh, in, within the 10 minutes as a prescribed uh, I we still have the issue with the sound, though, uh, though Lou. Sorry, sorry to, to be so uh, yeah. picky. Uh, maybe let me try again with my uh, with, with my microphone because it might be some contact problem. I and mean, if I try a second time, it, uh, maybe it would be better. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, is that better with the sound now? Uh, can you hear me at this moment? Not really. Just try. Can I suggest something? Can you please try yeah. to shout? Oh, yes. Yeah, I will. Like I really will. try to shout. Yeah. Sorry, I, I will raise my voice. Is that okay now for you? Yeah. Better. Thank you. Yeah. Very sorry for the delay. Uh, today I would like to talk about the Platonic tradition in medieval times and especially in the work of a 12th Byzantine monk called Eric of Revol. Um, so let, let us have a look at the Platonism in the Middle Ages. Uh, in the Middle Ages, Plato's works were not very much translated and uh, were not well, well known. But we have uh, some translations of his Meno and Phaedo, which was made in the 12th century. Uh, then we have some introduction of Parmenides made by William of Milbert, contemporary of Thomas Aquinas. And then we have a Timaeus in the partial translation of Pythidius, which is, uh, has already been known to uh, Augustine and also the early church fathers. So Timaeus was the most well-known text of Plato during the Middle Ages. Uh, but, but we still have a lot more sources uh, from which we can know Platonic thinking uh, and uh, transmitted uh, by Middle Platonists and also neo platonists So we have a Greek and a Latin church fathers who considered Plato as next to Moses, and we just have to adjust a little bit of Plato's wording so we have a question uh, out of him. Which, uh, that was a remark made by Augustine. But we can also see some uh, Platonic uh, tradition in also a uh, Boethius text, which is uh, Boethius' work were well known in the Middle Ages. Then we have Caecilius, Marcianus, Capella, Marcobius. Cicero and the Roman poets. Uh, Cicero was also very much read in the early Middle Ages. So we have a famous uh, Platonism in the 12th century, especially the School of Chaka. Uh, however, the School of Chaka gave us a lot of commentaries on Timaeus. Uh, Timaeus was very influential, influential for their cosmography. And also we have the English philosopher John of Salisbury, who was also a Platonist. Mm, but we, we can see that uh, the, uh, in the research and in our modern research, the focus was mostly uh, on the uh, Platonism uh, as uh, transformed, transferred uh, by uh, the Timaeus translation and the commentaries. However, I think that Plato's doctrine of the soul was a little bit neglected in the research. And that's the reason why I want to use the Eric of Rivo's text, the Anima, uh, to review this aspect of Platonism in the Middle Ages. We have a series uh, of these passing writers on the soul. For example, uh, the, uh, also an Englishman, Isaac of Stella, uh, he has also written a uh, three times on the soul, and we have William of Thierry, who was from the uh, uh, from France, and then we have an Eric of the uh, So let's have a look at the uh, next slide. 
and uh, uh, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, yeah, now I find this. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have. Uh, let's have a look at the Plato's doctrine of the soul. Uh, we see that in Plato, the soul is conceived as substantial, personal, and separable, and the soul is the invisible, divine, immortal, and wise. Uh, life was conceived as the logos of the soul, and in the Republic, we see that Plato uh, finds that only a portion of the soul survives the body after the death. And he has also talked about the social magnetism. Uh, in the, however, uh, despite the, the fact that, that only the, uh, the rational soul survives the body, but in the afterlife, the souls are seen as having all of the bodily characteristics, uh, which is uh, uh, which consists in perception, and that is an important feature which I want to talk about later. Uh, and uh, we can see also that the soul, the rational soul, is also active throughout all these sensational activities. Uh, if we are doing some kind of a perception, the soul is active, uh, and uh, which is also important for for our uh, for this uh, for, for my talk here. And we also see that in the Timaeus, Plato uh, talked about the distribution of the soul function to different parts of the body. Uh, this raises the problem of the relationship between soul and the body. And we see that all these Platonic things were picked up in Alice the Anima. And where uh, did he got all this Platonic stuff? Uh, we can see that it is transmitted. Uh, majorly by Augustine. So we see that Augustine has written a series of uh, three titles or dialogues on, um, on the soul, uh, which is his one is his early work, which is called Solopia, and uh, later he wrote uh, the Immortality Anime uh, on the immortality of the soul and the quantity of the soul. Uh, also about the origin of the soul, and we can uh, read a lot of his. Uh, doctrines on the cell in one of his theologian works called the Genesis as Literum, uh, about which is his commentary on the book Genesis. Uh, and all these works were well known to uh, to Eric of Vivo, and he uh, based his dialogue on the cell heavily on Plato's writings. So we see that uh, he lived between uh, uh, 1209 to 1267, uh, and we can so we can surmise that uh, the translation of, of the Pantheus was not known to him because of the time which uh, he, he uh, it was already in his uh, late uh, adult life when Pantheus translated Plato. Uh, however, uh, Eric must have learned a lot of. Uh, the content from Plato, uh, from Augustine's writings. And also there is a, a, a kind of argument for the immortality of the soul in Christian's uh, grammar book, which was read by the, uh, by the Middle Age, um, medieval people throughout the Middle Ages. And so we have this philosophical writing, the anima, which has three parts. And uh, it is his last uh, work written during the last uh, months of his life. Uh, so the content was complex. I, uh, I won't dwell too long on it. Book one uh, offers a definition of the soul and uh, the nature of the soul in relationship to the body. Book two concentrates on the functions of the soul, especially memoria, reason, and the will. So the book three is interesting because it discusses the status of the soul as a separated from the body. We can see that all three books are uh, very much related to the uh, doctrine of the soul offered by Plato. Uh, let's have some kind of, uh, uh, I have made a list uh, of what, what we can find, uh, 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 we can find in areas of the anima and the which uh, can be taken as a kind of a platonic legacy. So uh, this definition of the soul uh, is clearly platonic, we can see later. 
and then he offers out uh, us a kind of proof or argument for the immateriality of the self, and he quotes heavily from Augustine's on the um, uh, on the measurements of the self uh, or on the uh, magnitude of the self, which, which also is a translation of the title. And he offers um, um, likely also an argument for the immortality of the soul, and especially should concentrate on the personal immortality of the soul, which was also mentioned in Plato's Plato. And uh, uh, we can see that there is a kind of doctrine of the division of the soul and uh, about the soul and the body relationship. So let's, uh, let's see uh, how Platonic uh, Alice the anima is. Uh, we can see that uh, Eric defined the soul as a kind of life, the vita. I quoted uh, the Latin text, um, but I can uh, offer a, sm uh, 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 a kind of uh, explanation to that. Uh, he, he said that the, uh, the life is a kind of a, a ration, uh, soul is a kind of a rational, and uh, uh, it, it, it cannot be changed locally. But it can be changed the temple uh, in, uh, within the time because if the soul can become miserable or the soul uh, can become uh, happy uh, according to the activities of the soul. And in some kind of way, uh, the soul is immortal. Uh, and uh, we can see that it, its status can change. It can become uh, happy or uh, beatified or it can become miserable. So we can see that it is a kind of logical, logical training uh, which makes him uh, to do this kind of definition because he defines the uh, human self uh, with the genus uh, and the differentiated decision that typical uh, scheme. Uh, therefore, we can see that the human self was uh, differentiated from the soul of the plant and the beast uh, through the uh, differentiated typical nationalities. Rationalist. But also he, he distinguishes it from the soul of God and angel because it is uh, sort of a mutable. And so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, all the, the soul is only uh, uh, is not immortal in the way like of God is, uh, but uh, the soul is in some sort of way uh, immortal when it participates in the immortality of the God. And uh, God's uh, immortality consists in his unchangeable nature. Uh, the human soul can be distracted by diverse effects and the volition. And uh, uh, angels can be affected too, because angels are also created. Uh, therefore, uh, the soul of the human and uh, the soul of the angel can only participate in uh, that immortality that is God himself. And uh, we can see also there is also a kind of a, a component which distinguishes the human soul from uh, the soul of the angels, because the angels cannot become miserable and the demons cannot become beatified. So we see that uh, Eric defines the uh, foremost uh, at first uh, the soul uh, with the concept of life, which is the ancient Greek philosophical tradition. And we can see also that in the Phaedo, uh, Plato says that the soul is the logos, logos of life. And so we can see that um, this is a clearly a uh, iconic definition. And also, Eric later talks about the soul as a kind of substance. And so we can see that also uh, Plato's tradition was clearly visible in Eric's text. And let's proceed to the second part. In, uh, of the doctrines uh, on Eric, of uh, Eric, the doctrine of the soul. And uh, we can see that the soul, how the soul is related to the body. Uh, I I didn't find the, I, uh, I, I, I don't have the English translation of the title here uh, because I cannot find it in our library. Therefore, I can only use the Latin text here. Uh, so maybe I want to uh, translate it in all, but I will uh, explain it in my own words. Uh, we can find uh, this kind of description in the third part of the anima. And uh, uh, we can see that as long as the uh, soul is in the body, it uses the body as a bodily organ, as a kind of in instrument. 
So it performs all its functions. For example, the vegetative function for growth, and also the synthesis function, which is common between man and animal. Uh, so uh, by using the body, uh, the soul, by using the body, uh, motions and also sensations uh, comes from the body. Uh, however, uh, we, we can see that all these functions uh, are common between uh, human beings and also uh, animals. However, uh, we can see that there is a different status uh, when the body is gone. Uh, so the what uh, how uh, how uh, how is the soul? Uh, what about the status of the soul uh, when the body is done? Uh, that means after the death, when the uh, human soul is separated from the body, we can see that uh, the body is uh, corrupted, and with the body also the sensation. However, uh, the, per the perception is still remaining in the soul. That's a very uh, uh, important feature, and I think it is a very component because it is a difference between the Aristotelian uh, conception of the soul. Mm, because uh, Plato also ascribes a perception to the soul, and therefore the images can come from the sensational or uh, sensitive organs. And it remains in the memory, which is typical for the resonance. Uh, we can see that there are two different kinds of memories, according to Augustine and also to Arius. There is a memory which we uh, is common between man and animal. Animals can find their nest through memory. Uh, however, this kind of memory is a bodily memory, and it corrupts after the death, and is gone and doesn't remain after the death. But in the rational part of the soul of, of the human being, uh, there is also uh, memory remaining. And this main memory can operate with all the images which comes, uh, which came through the uh, senses, from the senses with our bodily organs. And why is that so important for Augustine and especially Alice? Uh, because Arid wants to mm, find a doctrine which can justify the emerging doctrine of the purgatory uh, in the 12th century. Uh, we see that the doctrine of the purgatory was not uh, very dominant in the early Christian times, but it became very uh, uh, dominant and important during the 12th century. We can see a series of works talking about uh, the status of the human being in the uh, purgatory. And uh, the status in the purgatory is especially interesting because it depicts the soul as separated from the body. After the resurrection, the human cell is uh, recombined with the body. Uh, therefore, we have the whole human being as a body and soul. However, in the status of the purgatory, uh, before the resurrection of all human beings, the soul is separated from the body. Uh, and in the purgatory, we, we know that the people can be attained, uh, or the souls can be attained, the separated souls can be attained. Therefore, others and the Arab, special Arab, want to justify uh, the, the, the doctrine, the theological doctrine, why the, uh, why the soul can feel the pain. And the uh, Arab said that it can feel pain through the images taken from the body, through the body. Uh, organ. And when the body is done, the images remain. Uh, therefore, we think uh, the soul can still use the imagination uh, to get pains and also feelings. So that's a very interesting feature because the feelings are not very much cut from the rational part of the soul. Uh, it still it still remains in the rational and the immortal uh, part of the soul. So let's have a look because my time is uh, proceeding. Uh, I want to talk about the, the immateriality of the soul. And we can see that uh, Elwood relies heavily on Augustine's work. Uh, and it's, uh, in, this, in this part, uh, the, the opinion differs a little bit from that of, uh, of, the, of Plato. Because uh, Plato ascribed in the Demiurgus uh, different functions of the soul uh, to different parts of the body. But 
uh, our question and Ellie the says that the soul is not in any location, but which can be said is in the body because it is a principle of life of the body. Uh, therefore, it is also extended uh, uh, all across the body, but it cannot become larger or smaller. And because of this, we cannot say we cannot say that the soul is in any location or it is uh, it has any kind of quantity. So uh, by this kind of uh, uh, argument, uh, Alice and this uh, Augustine and Alice argued for the immaterial reality of the soul. And uh, uh, also there is an argument that the soul can conceive notions that are not transmitted through bodily organs. Therefore, we can separate the soul from all the images taken from the body. Uh, we can see that we can conceive the soul's activity as a thinking and the rational thinking. And this kind of thinking is special to the soul and not empirical. Uh, therefore, uh, it is a good argument for the immaterial reality of the soul. And we can, it, which reminds us of, uh, also of the Plato's um, doctrine in the Bible. So the immortality of the soul, I'm not going to talk all these uh, uh, the passages. Uh, there is a small summary. Uh, the soul can conceive the sapientia wisdom. And the wisdom, uh, the highest wisdom is the notion of God. And also, in our soul, we can conceive a lot of uh, sciences, for example, mathematical sciences. And all these uh, evidence shows that the soul is immortal because it doesn't rely on the mortal sensational um, sensitive bodily organ. And uh, therefore, let's come, uh, uh, come to the last part uh, for the division of the soul. We can see that uh, in the Platonic tradi uh, tradition, Arid uh, divides the soul into the rational and the non rational part. Uh, however, there are some. Uh, so some uh, noble things in that. Uh, for example, um, uh, the the uh, the Aristotelian uh, uh, tradition can be visible because the Arab and the, uh, uh, also Augustine talks about uh, the vegetative soul and also the animal or the sensitive soul and the rational soul, which, which is uh, clearly uh, Aristotelian and not. Uh, uh, platonic. So we can see that for our conclusion, we can see that Arid uh, is very well aware of the stuff, of the content and of the arguments in Plato's Phaedo. Uh, however, uh, through the ages and transmitted by the uh, Neoplatonists, Arid uh, also combines Platonic thinking with uh, Aristotelian and also Stoic elements, which cannot be uh, explored in details here. Uh, however, we can see that also there is a further development uh, in, in uh, Augustine's and our Aries theory on the on the soul, uh, uh, which they developed the Platonic tradition. However, uh, they adapted the Platonic doctrine uh, of the soul uh, to, uh, according to the needs of the, the Christian Christianity and the Christian Christian uh, orthodoxy. So we can see that uh, they use the Platonic uh, doctrine on the soul also for the purpose of theology. Uh, thank you for, for the attention. I think I'll have to use a little bit more time than uh, I intended. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Lou. I need to tell you yeah. that we couldn't hear very well. We all tried very, very hard to follow your PowerPoint and it looks very very interesting did anyone understand enough to have a question i have a question just because what you were trying to say is is close to a topic that i've been working on but with your permission, I will email you rather than ask the question now, because I'm yeah. afraid we're running out of time. So I'm yeah. really, really sorry. I feel we need to move on. George, what do you think? Yes, we could go on. And uh, anyone who's interested could email. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you for all the effort. Thank you. Now, the, the next speaker is Scott Kennedy uh, from Bilger University. And the title is The Marriage of History and Philosophy, Laonikos Halkokondilis' Histories and Plato's Laws. If you please take the floor. Of course. Uh, let's start off. Can you guys hear me well? No issues with hearing. Okay. Uh, can I go ahead and share a PowerPoint? Do I have permission to do that? Okay. Okay, you can share now. Okay. Um, so can you see a PowerPoint? Okay, can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes, all right, yes. and let's go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll try and make this quick. As a way of prelude, I'll say that I'm a historian by training, not a philosopher. Um, part of the reason I wanted to come to this conference was to sort of have things pointed out to me that I might not have seen, simply because I don't have a training, let's say, in Neoplatonism, per se, but more of classics. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is a 15th century historian named Laonikos Halkogodilis, who is from Athens. Um, so very relevant to where we would be in better times. Um, and in the 15th century, Laonikos wrote a history of the rise of the Turks and the fall of Byzantium. In his time, the Roman Empire was not what it once was. All that really remained was Constantinople and the Peloponnese. Everything else had fallen to the Turks or various other foreign peoples. Um, as a period, it's a time where there's a great feeling of loss among people, of, among Romans who spoke Greek. As they watched Christian Greco-Roman culture daily eroded by the Turkish Islamic way of life. And so because of this, a number of Byzantium's final intellectuals became very interested in Plato's ideal concept of a politia. And by politia, I mean a way of life as well as an actual state or city related to it. And so because of this, they became very interested in how they could revive Byzantium in some way and to fix its politia. Um, the most famous, of these reformers, at least here in Greece, is George Gemistos Pithon, who was a noted Platonist in the 1410s. He advocated for a series of political reforms based on Plato's Republic and Sparta as it was imagined in Plutarch's life of Lycurgus. Um, in his final years, he secretly wrote a work called The Laws, just like Plato's Laws which was supposed to be a neo-pagan reimagining of the universe along um, Proclus's lines and Plato's, ultimately aimed to try to uncover ebemonia for everybody. Um, the work was quite radical. At one point, he advocates burning um, homosexuals, people who are commit bestiality, and any kind of Abrahamic sophists who try to argue against his beliefs. Um, so it's something of a totalitarian project mixed with Plato, perhaps not um, too far from what Plato would have done in the laws. In any case, um, he wrote this work and when it was discovered after his death, horrified Christian theologians burned it so we have only fragments of what he believed. But his ideal and his focus on finding this kind of ideal state that could be successful and revive Byzantium would passed on among his students. And so I'd like to focus on Lonikos. Um, he was one of Plethon's students in the 1440s. Unlike Plethon, he spoke Greek and Latin. He's supposedly extremely erudite in both. We have a lovely story about how he took a noted antiquarian, Kiriako Dancona, 
on a tour around Sparta in I think 1447 or so. Um, we don't have much else of him besides that little detail and his history. Uh, we do have a little marginal note he left in Herodotus where he sort of admires how the ancient Greeks were able to defeat the Persians and how they were lucky to have a Herodotus. Um, but we don't have much else from him. His history entitled The Proof of Inquiries is a Herodotian, a Herodotian history of the rise of the Turks and the fall of Byzantium. So just like Herodotus with the rise and fall of Persia. Um, it's characterized by a number of digressions on foreign peoples and their customs like Herodotus. And you'll note the title, um, the Apodexis Historion, which you can read here in the one of the manuscripts is a play on how Herodotus refers to his work in his proem. So because of this, um, people have typically tried to appreciate his inquiry, his proof of inquiries as a historical source. Um, in 2014, Anthony Caldellis took it a bit further and instead of just treating it as a source, he wanted to treat it as a neo as a sort of neo-pagan fusion of Herodotus and Thucydides. This was a study of historiography, not particularly concerned with the philosophy involved. Um, what I'd like to do in this paper is take our understanding of Laonikos in a different direction. Rather than understanding his work entirely as a history, I'd like to see it as a philosophical project, which was trying to discover, as Plato writes in the laws, which laws cause the preservation of what survives, and which laws the collapse of what collapses, and which laws could be substituted to create a happy city. Um, in my estimation, I think that what Laonikos is trying to do throughout his history is analyze the various customs of foreign people through a platonic lens, ultimately recording and recounting things that broke with Plato's ideas or could even improve on Plato's ideas in order to get a better concept of what an ideal politia is. So before we get into this, I probably should briefly sort of mention how we can see Laonikos's political leanings and his Platonism, um, as that probably needs to be proved before I actually try and read what some of his texts through a Platonic lens. So at present, we don't have any known marginalia in any Plato manuscripts. We don't have something like the Herodotus um, scolion that I showed you. Um, but we do know that other students of Plethon, people who would have been there at around the same time as Laonikos, were heavily interested in the political works and the political ideas of Plato. Um, one of the more neglected of these is Demetrius Raul Kavakis, uh, who has a, mar has a copy of the Republic with a series of marginalia. Um, which are often quite interesting because they make comparisons between what Plato's talking about in the present day. Here's one example when um, Plato describes the fevered state in book two of the Republic. Um, Kavaki's notes note how this is about the present day rulers, cities, and especially their inhabitants. So when Laonikos and his colleagues opened up Plato, they were clearly going to start to see their own society in Plato. And in this case, Kavaki saw his own society in the, society, in the tempered and fevered society um, described by Plato. Um, as for Laonikos' own Platonism, I think it most um, evidently comes out in a passage about the English Channel. So in a passage of book two of his history, Laonikos describes the tides of the English Channel and tries to explain how these tides work using the concept of the soul of the universe or the world's soul. 
Um, and he tries to talk about how the world soul is born along by either a kind of voluntary or involuntary motion. And as these motions move together to create the ebb and flow of the tides, they create growth and change. And it's this kind of very platonic idea of the tides ultimately leading towards harmony. And we as the individual with our own soul, when we watch the tides, we ourselves delight in that because we are experiencing and looking at this kind of same harmony. Um, so this is clearly modeled on and taken from the uh, Book 10 of the Laws, as well as the Timaeus. Um, for example, Timaeus 47 and 90 come to mind. Um, so in any case, we know that Laonikos was viewing the world through a platonic lens and even trying to apply that logic to describe how the English Channel works. Um, so if we move aside from this kind of notion of the world soul, um, for my presentation today, I wanna to just focus on his views of Islam, um, because this is where I think his Platonism comes out most evidently in all his history. Um, so I'll make it quick because we're running out on time, but essentially in Byzantium, um, Islam was not viewed favorably at all. Um, it's typically the religion of a fraud, Muhammad is often seen as a kind of barbarian who betrayed Byzantium and rebelled against it. And for that reason, his entire religion is fraud and ridiculous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and here in the text, I just quote for you one of the most typical stories that was known to people in Laonikos' time about the origin of Islam, where Muhammad is seen as a kind of vassal of the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius, who rebelled against him, and that's why Christians suffer today. Um, Plethon, Laonikos' teacher, had a more favorable vision of Islam, but it was still a qualified vision. So in his various political works, he describes how the Arabs conquered the world when they established lofts for themselves and a radical new politia. And even if these laws have no good purpose. They are seemingly suited for increasing cities and dominance in war. So Laonikos' teacher was very willing to appreciate how Islam could win wars and also make cities grow and get bigger. Um, at, least in the respect, at least in respect to the war part, he may have been viewing um, Islam through the lens of Sparta and Crete. Um, as Plato discusses in the law, Sparta and Crete had a telos of war and not justice. So that may be how he's sort of viewing Islam as a system with a lawgiver like Lycurgus or Minos, but a system that was designed specifically for war, not for justice. Um, but like Plato, Plethon certainly could appreciate Islam and some of its ideas. So his laws include five daily prayers at different hours of the day to the pagan gods. Um, this is clearly an innovation on Plato's call for daily prayers in the laws, as well as Proclus's system of prayers. So Laonikos, um, if we look at his description of Islam, is even more favorable to it than Plethon. For example, he describes how Arabia is inhabited by the men who are most just and extremely wise in matters of their religion. He discusses how Muhammad's law code bears the mark of a just man and not someone who became a tyrant. So he's very willing to depart from the Byzantine tradition. A part of why I think he was departing from this is because if you read Islam, at least Islam as Laonikos understood it, with a Platonic lens, it's actually a system that a Platonist could admire quite a bit. Um, so for example, when he discusses the creation of the Islamic law code, he departs from Christian tradition that said, Muhammad came with the sword, not with persuasion. 
Instead, he talks about how Muhammad started with persuasion and only later he moved to using force against people. So this may perhaps have reminded Lonikos of Plato's statements about the necessity of persuasion when introducing a law code, the idea of the preambles that we see in the laws, or even in Plato's discussion of how to introduce laws with persuasion in book 10, discussing religion. Um, as far as sort of concepts go, there are a number of other things that a Platonist could admire, such as the fact that Muslims believe in the immortality of the soul, they hold that God does not possess ignorance or want of feeling. Um, immortality of the soul was not entirely clear or approved as a church doctrine um, in Byzantine Christianity. So his admiration for these kinds of things may be tempered a little bit by his Platonism. Um, at one point, he discusses how in Muslim belief, God governs all, and as his servants, he used what they call fiery minds, uh, Pirinis Nois. Uh, so this is an interesting little passage because he appears to be referring to the Muslim concept of angels. Angels are supposed to be made of light, not fire. Fire is what Satan is made of. So there's a bit of an error here. Um, but in sort of the Muslim tradition, the angels of Islam are often equated in Muslim philosophy with the planets, and they're governed by a kind of intellect, or I guess what we would call a nuz. So as Lonikos was interacting with Muslims, he may have caught in, in contact with some of these ideas and been able to see sort of the parallels with Plato's own ideas about the fact that the universe is governed by stars and these stars are governed by nous. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, in any case, I'll make this short as the dog is um, going a little wild now. Uh, so finally, what we might say is that he also has a bit of admiration for the law code of Islam and its emphasis on prayer. Uh, incorrectly, he says that Muslims pray for four times a day, um, but he seems to have, like Plethon, been intrigued by the idea of creating prayer as a constant way of forcing a person to think about virtue and seen this as something that, as he writes, may have been what made Arabs particularly just and extremely wise in matters of their religion. Um, so there's more I could say. Um, he has many other digressions on different foreign peoples, um, many of which show platonic influence, um, but obviously we're short on time. So let me conclude here by basically saying that what I think we have with Laonikos is an attempt to take the projects of Plato and Laonikos's fail or excuse me, Plethon's failed um, state, and to try and look at different foreign peoples and discover what works best. And that even that means recording and looking at different customs and foreign people in order that one day Laonikos could find the best possible state with which to revive the Greek people and give them liberty once more. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, speech. We have a little time for questions. We must speed up. Uh, if you can share your your uh, uh, your screen. Uh, the first yep. question, please. Yeah. I would like to ask something. Uh, uh -huh. Laonikos is writing in a, in a state of decline, isn't it so? So he's talking about the the fate of the states of the states that can be eternal. Uh, that means they change all the time. We can have a, a strong state that becomes a failed state, and again a strong state, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, is he trying to stop this uh, this movement? 
or uh, um, he, or he's just describing uh, the fate of the of the different states. Is, does he think that we can, in a way, stop this movement of uh, decline? So that is a good question. I'm not entirely certain Laonicus thought you could stop the decline. Um, by the time Laonicus is writing, the Greek state is gone. So it's completely gone. You need to find new laws, new customs. He talks about Greeks as if the famous line he uses, which people have misunderstood so badly, is he at one point says that the Greeks of Thucydides, the Greeks of Herodotus, they had no virtue. Their virtue was commensurate to their fortune. They only got lucky. So he completely <laughs> throws a dagger at anything in the ancient Greek tradition. And instead says Romans were the most virtuous. You know, even they declined um, because they became like Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if he was interested in stopping it. I think he was interested in finding what works best and admiring states that had been able to stop decline. A good example of this is Venice. So from a uh, platonic perspective, Venice is everything that could potentially go wrong. It's a merchant state with a navy, basically right on the sea, you can sail around. Um, it's basically the Atlantis of the uh, medieval world. And Lonicos pauses to talk about how it is that such a state could be, as he calls it, most securely governed how it could be so successful. So it's a mix of these things. Um, obviously, from a rhetorical perspective, if you were going to describe how to stop this flux of rise and fall of states, you'd probably do it in a panegyrical context. Um, Laonikos's fellow student of Pleton, Bessarion, talks about how Trabzon, Trebizond um, on the Black Sea supposedly shares part of the god's um, origins. It's founded by divine men. And that's why it's never been able to grow and decline. It's just always gotten better. Um, but that's a panegyrical context where he's clearly ripping off of the ideas of the laws and the Timaeus. So, sorry, that was a very long-winded explanation to- No, 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 it's, it's, very, it's very interesting, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a little time for a second question. Uh, yeah, I think I see it in the chat. Okay, I think I see it in the chat from Nikos. Um, would you say that Alonicus believed or even hoped that Muslims would succeed where Pleton failed? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think Alonicus thought that Muslims would succeed. I think he admired their law code and saw that there were bits and pieces of it that maybe a new Christian system should take up or a new neo-pagan system should take up such as prayers. You would worship Zeus five times a day at different hours and have this kind of very regimented religious life. Um, I think he also admired the totalitarianism of Islam uh, like Pleton, he talks about how Muslims basically kill anybody who doesn't follow the law, which in one context you could read that negatively, but I think given the fact that Pleton wanted to burn people who disagreed with his religion, this was probably a positive, that you burn the people who don't agree with you. So I think there were bits and pieces he wanted to take up um, and that at the moment he could see that Islam was successful. And so he wanted to observe some of the things that made Islam successful so that you could take those bits and pieces and import them into a new neo-pagan system. So I hope that answers your question sufficiently. I yes, it does. We, have, we don't have very much time, we should proceed. And uh, uh, everybody must respect now the 20 minutes rule. It's uh, the next speaker is Maria Varlamova, and uh, the topic is prime, prime matter as extension in Simplicius's commentary on Aristotle's physics. If you please. Yes. Hello. Hello. Do you hear me well? 
We hear you well, yes. Yes, okay, so I try to. <clears throat> In Timaeus, Plato, Plato introduces the notion of a receptacle of forms, which is devoid of any characteristics in its own right. Aristotle uses the, the notion of the receptacle describing his own concept of prime matter. Matter is devoid of any characteristics and therefore it can receive any form and it is a substrate of all physical bodies. However, matter as such escapes any definition. So, matter as a principle of physical bodies is a necessary cause for the generation, but it is impossible to know anything about matter. As Sorbju once said, matter is something I don't know what. But there is one thing bodies have due to matter, the extension in three dimensions or volume onkels. That's why the concept of matter is connected in the late antique tradition with the notion of corporeal extension. The question is how exactly is it connected? Uh, matter as a formless receptacle as well as a principle of corporeal extension was discussed in the late Platonic tradition. Philoponus, partly inspired by Stokes, suggest rather a radical decision. In his treatise Contra Proclam on the Eternity of the World, he claims that there is no such thing as formless and incorporeal matter. Uh, consequently, the prime matter is an empty name. If we ex extract all formal qualities from a physical body, we will have a body devoid of its qualities and de determined magnitude body qua body. The only one characteristic of this body is its volume or th three-dimensional extension. Philopolis believes that undetermined three-dimensional extension is the first substrate of all bodies and that there is no other first substrate. Thus, matter is not I don't know what. It is something quite familiar. This means the unlimited three-dimensional extension is the definition and essence of matter. matter. It is interesting that Simplicius Discussing prime matter, Elzo describes it as a kind of body and an unlimited extension, as you can see in the citation of this uh, on the slide. Uh, I, I will not read it. I hope you can read it uh, from the slide. Uh, accordingly, matter is an extension. The question is, does Simplicius actually try to give here some definition of, of matter or not? Is his concept of prime matter similar to one of Philoponus? I believe that Simplicius doesn't suggest here some new definition of matter, but rather follows along the lines of Plotinus third. In the Aeneid, in the second Aeneid, Plotinus discusses matter as a principle of physical bodies. To sum it up, Plotinus distinguishes between the magnitude and the volume or mass or cost of a body, qualifies the volume as a logos, which is in the matter when the matter has already been shaped, claims that matter accepts some form and provides it with extension insofar as bodies have their volume and magnitude because of matter and shows that matter is apprehended by so-called buster reasoning as a phantasm of a corporeal volume. Now let us start, turn to Simplicius. Mm. Simplicius considers um, uh, matter as a principle of existence of all corporeal forms. In the course of that consideration, 
And further, I summarize. First, he claims that matter is a principle of difference between corporeal and incorporeal forms. The corporeal form differ from incorporeal by volume or mass, extension, and divisibility, which is common to all bodies. Bodies have these qualities only due to their matter. Second, Simplicius makes di distinction between magnitude as a form or limit of a body and extension, which fills the limit. He claims that the substrate of a body itself is not the extension and divisibility, which are determined with respect to measures, but those which are without matter. The extension of matter is indefinite, that's why matter is capable of being determined by formal measures. And third, he claims that unlimited extension of matter is required for existing of material forms and that, that uh, due to the unlimited extension of matter, the bodily change in respect of a size is possible. And thus, according to Simplicius, uh, Oh no. Uh, matter itself is unlimited extension deprived of any measure or quality. The extension of prime of the prime matter underlies the forms and persists through all kinds of change. Moreover, in the initial citation above, uh, Simplicius claims that the nature of matter is not determined by three dimensions and he separates a corporal form for, of matter from matter itself. The corporal form, uh, that is three-dimensionality, sets a limit to dispersion of matter and, determine, and determines it. According to Simplicius, matter as such has no corporal form, therefore its extension and dispersion are not three-dimensional. Consequently, the extension of matter is limited by two forms, the form of corporality, which transforms the dispersion of matter into an unlimited three-dimensional extension, and the form and shape of the body, which sets a limit and measure to the three-dimensional extension. Therefore, Synthesis defines matter as an extension deprived of three dimensions. Uh, and qualifies three dimensions as a logos which is bound together with matter. While Philoponus defines matter as a three dimensional extension, for Simplicius, the extension is no ways a proper definition of matter. Uh, he claims rather that matter as such has no definition at all because it has no form or difference in itself. Uh, the cognition of matter leads literally to ignorance. Therefore, it isn't possible to know matter as it is, but it is possible to know matter by analogy with something. Simplicius suggests the way to grasp matter by analogy with the unlimited corporeal extension. The three-dimensionality actually is a form and definition, whereas matter, matter as such escapes every definition, and therefore it also escapes the logos of three-dimensionality. As we remember, Aristotle considers matter by analogy with a bronze deprived of qualities of the bronze, and Simplicius considers matter by analogy with, with an extension deprived of three-dimensionality. The comparison of matter with bronze is possible because matter is a principle of generation, as a cause that out of which. The comparison of matter with three-dimensionality is possible because matter, matter is a principle of corporality of material form. In other words, Simplicius suggests the way of cognition of matter by analogy with, with a three-dimensional extension. We know that the unlimited three-dimensional extension is therefore uh, uh, therefore we could imagine the unlimited extension of matter, although that extension is beyond any dimensions and beyond our percep perception. To conclude, Simplicius as well as Plotinus def uh, first defines matter as a principle of corporeal volume and the principle of difference between bodies and non-corporeal entities. Second, 
distinguishes between measure as such and corporeal volume as form and limit, which is composed with matter as a substrate of bodies. And third, points out that matter could be knowable only by analogy with the perceptible corporeal volume. Matter is a bulb deprived of three dimensions. We can imagine such a bulb only by analogy with three-dimensional volume that is familiar to us. Um, that's why the notion of matter is a phantasm and the knowing of matter is ignorance. Um, and Simplicius demonstrates that matter is knowable by analogy with unlimited corporeal abstention, which is knowable uh, to us. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. If you please. I, I, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I'm trying okay. to. Oh, oh, how to do it? Uh, we will proceed to questions. Um, oh, yes. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, Oregon. Maria, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. I I really like your instinct here to see um to see Simplicius here in relation to Plotinus two four, uh, the those later chapters of two four up to sixteen. Um, I think that's exactly right. And my question to you is this: um, In a sense, would Simplicius have two views of matter here, just as he has two views of body, perhaps? That is that correspond in a way to Plotinus. Let's say on the one hand, Plotinus has, let's say in 5.8 chapter 7, he says that uh, matter is a final form. That's one side of it. And yet, of course, in 2.4, uh, 2.5, 3.6, and finally 1.8, but particularly in 2.4, which I think you're right to pick up, he sees matter ultimately as something which flees from form which is bodiless in another way. And so Simplicius really, does he, as it were, does he um, develop really two views of matter, a positive view of matter, and on, on the one hand, um, following one side of Plotinus's thought and a negative view of matter on the other side, following Plotinus's treatment of uh, analysis, deeper analysis of privation and indefiniteness in Ennea 2.4. What would you yeah. say, if, if you understand me? Yes, I understand you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, actually, I I think that uh, Simplicius, as maybe as well as Aristotle, have a positive view on matter as a principle of generation of physical bodies. Uh, and the matter as a principle, uh, he, he considered the matter as a principle of extension. But he know uh, he, he claims that uh, the extension of matter is not what we could see or perceive or know. It is not the three-dimensional three extension which we, we, we can um, um, which we can know. And uh, he I do not think that he really have uh, has a uh, uh, positive view on matter as an as an uh, assumption as something definite as an extension uh, for example i think uh, as i uh, as I, uh, I, as i was trying to uh, um, to uh, to tell uh, that uh, he tries to uh, find a way to know matter matter uh, by analogy with something which is familiar to us uh, first and second, by, anal by analogy with, with something which is um, very close to body, so to the volume, bodily volume. So uh, that's why, um, well, you know, for example, Franz de Hayes, Franz de Hayes, in his book about Philoponus, he uh, claims that Simplicius makes a Mm, very similar, um, have a very, very similar understanding of matter as an extension. But mm, I think that uh, this understanding of matter is not um, is not a positive uh, definition. So uh, for Philoponus, 
the abstention is a positive definition of matter. But for uh, simplicius, uh, abstention is not a positive definition. It's just a way to point on, on, on matter. And um, for and about Plotinus, I couldn't tell more because I'm actually not um, good at Plotinus. I'm, I'm, my, my, um, uh, I work with Simplicius and Philopinus more. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we should proceed to the next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting speech. And the next speaker is Georgi Liopoulos from the University of Athens. And the topic is dialectic in Proclus and the unity of philosophical disciplines. Mr. Liopoulos, please. I don't hear anything. Is there anyone else? No, no, I think he has uh, he has himself muted. Uh, George, no. can you hear us? You need to unmute yourself, please. We don't hear anything. Yorgo uh, then Akume. No. George, can you use the chat to communicate to us whether you have um, heard us? <clears throat> George, I can see you, but I can't hear you. Γιώργο, μήπως να κλείσεις το, το PowerPoint και να το δείξω εγώ. Mm -hmm. But we can't hear you. Have you plugged your, your headphones properly? We can see the content, but we can't hear you. Have you seen at the bottom of the screen <clears throat> where it says mute?
we just can't hear you. <clears throat> And I can't do very good lip reading either. <laughs> I, I can see you saying sorry, but I can't hear anything. I can't understand anything else. Can you hear us? Do you have an external microphone? You need to go to the microphone settings of your computer and set it up. George, I think we are already pressed for time. Yeah. Maybe we should leave this speech for after the keynote. Yes, surely yeah. he will have enough time to work out the, the problem. Uh, the problem. Jo um, George, isn't it? George, if you hear me, I think your microphone is not connected to your machine. So you either need to use an external microphone or set up the connection. Mm -hmm. so, Maybe so we'll after the keynote. So it, in order to fix the problem, mm -hmm. we'll meet again in uh, five o'clock Athens time. Yes, please. Nico, you're muted as well. Sorry, sorry Eva. Sorry, George. May I uh, make a suggestion, you know, out of the blue, because I am the first speaker after the keynote speaker. Uh, I would like to propose just to switch sides, switch positions with uh, Georgos and talk now, although I'm less prepared than usual. But anyway, if it is okay with you. Uh, sure. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, simply, simply, simply to save time, you know, so as uh, Georgos can have his full 20 minutes, you know, time. And then because if we are six people, you know, after the keynote speaker will be jammed. Is it okay it's with perfectly, everybody? It's perfectly fine. Go ahead. Unless you are expecting so, a particular audience, go ahead. Uh, my my desired audience is the heart of beloved people. So I don't know how many. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, apologies to begin with. Okay, I have a the Dropbox. So if it is not trouble for you, you can just. Uh, download it from the Dropbox, my handout. Uh, I'll be briefer than usual. And thank you. I, I, I'm really enjoying yesterday, but particularly today's talks anyway. Okay. Don't, don't make me run out of, out of time. So, landscapes, okay, and settings of Plato's dialogues. When constructing the setting for those dialogues, Plato wishes his audience to know where they take place, he makes use of urban spaces. These are mostly semi-private buildings, such as the House of Cephalus in the Republic, and Euclidus at Megara in the Theodetus, or Tavres Wrestling School. It's the setting of the comedies. Actually, I'm speaking from a few hundreds away, far away from Tavres Wrestling School here. So greetings from Palmyra to, to all of you. Uh, the same goes with Gymnasia, uh, which is the case with Euthydemus, uh, and the state buildings associated with the trial of Socrates, namely the Royal Store, the courtroom of Helia and the state prison. Two dialogues break out of the confines of this spatial urbanism and set up the scenery in a pleasant spot outside the city walls. The Phaedrus presents Socrates and Phaedrus taking turns between delivering speeches and reclining under a plane tree in a grove at the banks of the Lys River. And at the closing scene of the fourth book of the laws, the three old men, these are the first two passages in your handout, uh, at the closing scene of the fourth book of the laws, the three old men, after a long and presumably tedious walk, finally reached the idyllic resting place they were heading out to from the beginning, without ever reaching their original destination of the pilgrimage, namely the sanctuary of Zeus at the top of Mount Ada. Although the setting of the laws, if you 
make the comparison, looking at the, at the handout, you, it's pretty obvious. Although the setting of the laws is an extended version of and the second order command on that of the Fidras, the respective reception history could not be more different. The Attic landscape was almost canonized as the archetypal prose Locus Amenus. Whereas, thank you so much. Whereas, his Crete and counterpart slipped quietly into an almost complete intertextual oblivion. Despite their interconnectedness, such a development, thank you, is less inexplicable than it may at first seem. As Plato's final word in the practical implementation of the blueprint for an ideal city, the laws has been influential for later readers interested in political philosophy and the principles embedded in the recorded legislation. Two passing references to a pleasant landscape separated by the one third of the longest platonic dialogue may easily be compared to the proverbial needle in a haystack. So, since this landscape does not seem to have any bearing on what the three age mates are talking about. In the feeders, on the other hand, the physical environment is so intertwined, and we can just scroll down, please, a little bit to see the second passage of the feeders, with the, oh, thank you, with the argument of the dialogue that it almost takes a life of its own, much like a third dramatis persona. It is in a sacred piece of uncultivated land dedicated to the local deities, you know, the statues of the gods, that Socrates argues for the gifts of divine madness while producing extemporary speeches and admitting that he has been possessed by the nymphs. He calls himself an infolipos. It is when Socrates is about to cross the river that his daemonion intervenes, implying that unless Socrates repents, Elysus turns into an impenetrable aquatic wall, the ultimate gatekeeper that Socrates may force his way through at his own peril, much like Homeric Achilles when fighting Scamander. No wonder the setting of the Phaedrus has acquired an iconic status in Plato's reception and been replayed in a variety of works throughout antiquity and beyond. At the same time, Socrates' detailed description of the grove at Elysus, an arrestic image in itself, comes from what was arguably Plato's bestseller for the most part of the first Christian millennium. Imitations of and allusions to the scenery of the Phaedrus are regularly placed in, a, in the three first Christian centuries, in a context that is hospitable to Plato, either due to suggestive subject matter or a selective similarity in diction or both, the reader has been led to expect that elements from the Platonic intertext are about to pop up anytime soon. The authors of late antiquity have a quite different tale to tell. And now, please, we can move on to uh, page number three, I think. Again, I think. One may still come across passages in which the late antique space is directly associated with classical antiquity in general uh, and all the ancient gods in particular. Evidently, the relevant evaluative connotations may vary depending on the writers of religious affiliation. Plato may still be explicitly mentioned or dwelling inside the audience's horizon of expectations, yet the novelty of the period, i.e. late antiquity, is the radical transformation of the Platonic locus by means of its appropriation by mostly, but not exclusively, Christian writers. Elements from the landscape of Elysus are selectively reworked to be incorporated into the new textual edifice, more often than not completely unrelated to the original one. Nevertheless, the Platonic spolium, in terms of architecture, as it were, is there, recontextualized, but fully recognizable in its new guise. And now a very quick look uh, to the passages. A number of sources may indicate the trajectory of its late antique transformations. Eusebius, passage number three, I guess, in our handout. Let me check it for myself. I think it's number three. No, no, number two. Number two. Passage number two, uh, which is, has the title Licinius Demonic Enclave. It's from Eusebius Vita Constantini, Life of Constantine. And it's, um, it's the, the time, the night sh oh, before the Battle of Adrianople, 324. Uh, the battle that Constantine the Great defeated Licinius' forces. And here you can check, uh, you can see the text and the translation for yourselves. Um, Eusebius is the first late antique writer that invokes the setting of the Phaedrus simply by calling this enclave, this secluded area, it's a grove which is well watered and thicky growing, and it's a sacred place, the sacredness. The uh, presence of abandoned water and the statues of the gods 
what in, uh, was no, normal presence in, in Plato's time, now it becomes the sacred place for Licinius and his own, uh, you know, uh, religion, which was uh, a kind of Neoplatonic uh, religion, uh, in a sense, and it becomes demonized in Eusebius' um, narrative, okay? So, um, Eusebius makes it the topos of Licinius' speech to a selected group of officers the night before the Battle of Antrenopol. Here is a contested space of military slash religious slash cultural conflict. The most unexpected new identity for the Platonic intertext, and please move to passage number three in your handout, is the one created by John Chrysostom. It's, by the way, it's a very interesting uh, piece of uh, speech in itself, a trilogy, which addressed to parents that they have uh, some qualms or they, they uh, resist their people, their, their sons of becoming monks. And so here in John Chrysostom's uh, speech, uh, the author turns the setting of the features into a monk's abode. The father of the church constructs a heavenly landscape, offering his reader a full taste of paradise. Here is nature in its original, uncorrupted, prelapsarian beauty. A place of ultimate pleasure, and that's the important, the important thing, and, and rather uh, intriguing thing. The previous paragraph, uh, Chrysostom argued that the monk is the uh, is excels in health, that is, uh, has the healthier body because it lives in nature. And one would expect that this could be the main argument, you know, for choosing a life in nature as a monk than a life in the city as whatever, as an official of the of the state. But the important thing that here. He, uh, he gives the reason that he has the greater pleasure ever, Idoni. And uh, I think it's not by chance that he chooses to reformulate, to refashion the Grove at Lysus in terms of pleasure, pure pleasure, that is the pleasures of seeing, of sound and sight, with many platonic intertext, which is uh, feasting the eye and his eye feasts on the vision, a direct inference uh, to the Republic and, of course, the Phaedrus, you know, the soul, and he, looking at the uh, supra celestial ideas. Uh, on thoughts, the, his version may be truer to the spirit of the Phaedrus than those of most late antique writers. And let me conclude by um, taking a quick look at the authors of the of, from Gaza. Okay, the authors from Gaza are the ones programmatically aiming at the Christianization of the imagery. Aeneas, passage number four in your handout. Uh, he talks about a self-grown vine um, that he uh, grew in his, uh, his house. Uh, he, he uses this imagery to answer the um, argument that how the body may be resurrected, the body, not only the soul, you know, in the second, uh, second coming of the Christ. And he says that, uh, don't worry about it, uh, the main, uh, as from a small seed, you can see a whole plant to grow up, and uh, with the branches and the leaves and so on, uh, as from a small salmon, a whole human body, you know, um, begins to grow. It, in a similar manner, all the dispersed, all the, the, the dismembered parts of, of, of a person after his demise, um, they will gather up and they will form the original identity of an ideal, if you like, body you had throughout your life. Um, and he uses this paradigm, this example, of the self-growing grapevine, and obviously the image of the vine, it's the Christian element, the vine replaces the plain tree in this in this reworking the fashion of the features. Um, and it is then condenses, domesticates, it's, we have a, an urban space now, not, not a, 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 a rural landscape, and Christianizes the platonic landscape. He talks about a grapevine in front of one's house that grows without human intervention. The entry of the fetus is miraculously reborn as the grapevine of the gospel. Zacharias Rastikos, his friend and, and pupil, next passage, please, in turn urbanizes the whole image, imagery by substituting the sacred nature of Ilysus for Gaza's cathedral. Here, the main the key elements are the, um, the verb exenagite, xenagisas, and uh, the, the adjective pangalos, you know, very beautiful. Instead of describing a natural landscape, um, the speaker of the dialogue, Ammonius, describes the cathedral of Gaza. Okay. 
And uh, last, but definitely not least, and here is a very interesting um, piece of intertextuality, Procopius, I think it's the last um, passage in our handout, talks about Daphne, Daphne Antioch's um, suburb, returns to the suburb of Daphne, which was a, a familiar, you know, uh, object of ekphrasis of description in late antiquity, by means of a bull move. Perhaps he's the first one, or at least he's the first one that he does so, he does this so elaborately. But what he does, what does he do? He builds on earlier comments, presumably by Julian and Themistius, and he produces an elaborate locus amenus, fusing both platonic passages, both the passages from the Phaedrus and the laws in one elaborate narrative. In this case, the cypress trees, the plane trees. Thank you so much for listening to my short presentation. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our rescue. Thank you. <laughs> we have some time for a question. Do you think, Eva? Yes, yes, <clears throat> yes. So we, we can take at least one question. Can I, can I start by asking? I can't see uh, anyone yes, else uh, on the screen, but I'll ask this. Um, I totally understand the platonic um, vibes of the landscapes that you are presenting in these later authors, but do you think they are using the these descriptions with a clear, conscious, platonic intention? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, or is it already part of the um, of the fabric of the literary fabric that they are using by that time? I see. Very good question. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I in, I put into my handout only the most um, obvious, the most uh, if you like, not self-evident, nothing self-evident. You know, passages. There are quite many passages that they allude to the figures, but here. The use of some fiction, the use of specific verbs, and uh, a case study for that is John Chrysostom's speech in itself, which is filled because he addressed himself to a father who is pagan. Okay, so he uses um, text from the from the father's you know, horizon of expectations to reply to his uh, refusal. Um, these particular passages, I'm pretty much, you know, I believe that they were they were meant uh, to be understood as rewritings of the platonic images so they expect the readers to understand plato to be uh, familiar with the reception of that image and eusebius for example it's it's a case in point eusebius militarizes as it were you know their plato and our plato because eusebius is a matter of plato as well so uh, in in the battle of the Genopole, as it were you have the collusion and the collision sorry of two worlds and two platos like so my your interesting question, which is not very brief, is that yes, and, uh, and uh, with qualification as well. Thank you, thank you very much. That's a very interesting topic to keep talking about. Would there thank be any other much. question? Quick one. I'll stop sharing so I can see what's going on. Can I ask a question, Eva? Yes, please. Yes, sorry. Hi, thank you so much. I found that really, really interesting. I'm not very familiar with the work that you've been um, talking about. Mm. Were you saying that um, they were describing, so they're not actually um, like referencing explicit, explicitly to these platonic writings, but they they were creating that landscape like that. Is that what you're saying? Like it was. I see your point. Thank you, Amber. I'm saying that they were later. They know their Plato. The readers, they expect the readers to know their Plato, and it's a part of you know both a part of uh, a means for persuading you. My argument, but both a means of showing not showing off as a bad word. I mean, of showing my erudition, my pedia, that I can work with all the material and mm -hmm. create something new with that. So yes, the reference to Plato specifically is uh, is certain. Is certain. That's why I found what Procopius did, if it really this is the case, which I think it is, was very interesting. Anyway. Okay, so it's like a literary illusion, would you say? Yes, yes, but it's nothing more than, than that. It's, I 
I rewrite Plato. Uh, uh, you know, what's what's the proverb? New wine in old skins or vice versa? I always confuse that. Well, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's uh, I, I become, you know, I, I recreate it. For example, like, yeah, anyway, I'm uh, the new uh, Michelangelo, you know, Stipelle 16 or something like that. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for saving us five minutes for quick glass of water before we go for the keynote speech. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the attire. Okay, I didn't have time. I had thought you know of changing, but anyway. Thank you all. Thank you. Επα να σε ρωτήσω κάτι. Μετά στην τέτοια παρουσιάζω εγώ είναι σειρά μου να παρουσιάσω εγώ τον keynote speaker. Ωραία. Μετά θα το θέλεις να διευθύνεις τη συζήτηση εσύ πώς θέλεις να κάνουμε όταν ξα... ξαναβρεθούμε εδώ. It's perfectly fine. Do you want me to take over? It's fine. Ε, όπως θες. Μήπως επειδή μιλάω και εγώ ας πούμε. Αλλά αν είσαι κουρασμένη είναι και βράδυ τώρα φαντάζομαι εκεί πέρα. No, Ο... no, 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 no. Don't you worry. I'm, I'm perfectly recharged. Δεν υπάρχει κανένα πρόβλημα. Ε, προχώρεση με τις... Ε με τα introductions, και όταν έρθει η σειρά σου, I'll take over. Οκ. Εντάξει. Ωραία. Οπότε τα λέμε σε πέντε λεπτάκια. Τα λέμε σε πέντε λεπτά. Ευχαριστώ πολύ, Γιώργο. Και εγώ, και εγώ εδώ. Μπορείς να μ' ακούσεις τώρα, μπορείς να μιλήσεις. Μ' ακούτε τώρα. Ανάσταση. Ανάσταση, ναι. Ναι. Η Ανάσταση σχετίζεται και με αυτό που ξεκίνησα να λέω που δεν με ακούγατε. Την ώρα που ξεκινούσα, που θα μιλούσα, μου ήρθε τρέιλερ ο θάνατος του Ευάγγελου Μουτσόπουλου. Γιώργο, ζωή σε εμάς. Δεν ξέρω. Mm. Ε, 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 Εύα, δεν τον γνωρίζεις. Ήταν παλιός καθηγητής, επόπτης του Κέντρου Φιλοσοφίας στην Ακαδημία, ακαδημαϊκός δηλαδή. Εγώ δούλεψα εκεί στο Κέντρο Φιλοσοφίας για 12 χρόνια, το 1998. Στο... Επομένως, δεν ήξερες καλά τον άνθρωπο. Είχαμε καθημερινή επαφή, αλλά... Ήταν μεγάλο η ηλικία, ήταν πόσο... Πρέπει να είναι 91, έτσι, 91. 91. Από φυσικά, έτσι απέφανε ο άνθρωπος ή από... Ήταν από, από την δεκαετία του 2000. Είχε προβλήματα mm. κοινωνικά και τα λοιπά, εντάξει, νομίζω... Πλήρης ημερών, πλήρης ημερών. Πλήρης ημερών και, και τιμών. Και τιμών. Ακόμα και καλύτερα. Mm. Ακόμα και καλύτερα. Μακάρι να φτάσουμε mm. στην ηλικία του. Ε, Γιώργο, ξέχασα να σου πω, μόλις σκέφτηκα μία πολύ καλή, νομίζω εγώ, ιδέα και τη μοιράστηκα με την α, φίλη μας που δεν μπορούσε να κάνει την παρουσίαση νωρίτερα, θα κάνει mm. ένα recording της ομιλίας της και θα μας το στείλει να το μοιραστούμε μαζί με τις υπόλοιπες παρουσιάσεις στο... Στο τεκριστό ιδιού, στο κανάλι που θα το ανεβάσουμε. Είναι πολύ καλή ιδέα, πάρα πολύ καλή ιδέα. Γιατί ξέρεις, σκεφτόμουν να σκεφτόμουν τι να κάνουμε, τι να κάνουμε γι' αυτό και νομίζω ότι θα το λύσουμε έτσι το θέμα. Ωραία, πάρα πολύ καλά. Εγώ θα σου στείλω τις μαγνητοσκοπήσεις αυτές. Ίσως χρειάζονται λίγο editing, δεν ξέρω. Νομίζω θα το συζητήσουμε, θα το συζητήσουμε. Yeah. Ε, έχω μία ομάδα που μπορεί να δουλέψει σε αυτό. Α, σπουδαία, σπουδαία. Πολύ καλά, πολύ καλά. Okay. Καλησπέρα σας. Συγγνώμη, Καλώς ήρθατε. Πριν λόγος για κάποιον άνθρωπο που εξεδίμησε από τη ζωή. Ο ακαδημαϊκός ο Μουτσόπουλος μας έλεγε ο συνάδελφος, ο κύριος Ηλιόπουλος. Α, τι λέτε. Α, μάλιστα, μάλιστα. Γεια σου, Δημήτρη. Γεια σας. Χαίρομαι που σας βλέπω. Και εγώ, τι κάνεις. Πρέπει το Θεό καλά. Όπως και γενικά βεβαίω από τους συνδεδημόνες. Ευχαριστούμε. Should we wait two more minutes for everyone, or should we begin? What do you think, Eva? Give it a couple of more minutes. I feel now much more relaxed than that we are, you know, solvent as it were. In terms of time and you know the microphone is working and everything is fine. Okay. Two tip, two minutes.
Mm -hmm. I thought the keynote went really well. I was very pleased with it. Mm -hmm. Very rich paper. I was trying to kind of process everything with them. Maybe you do want a, a keynote like that to, to, to get you thinking. Be back in one minute. Okay, so we can start again. Hello to everybody. To everybody, we resume with um, uh, with the speech of uh, the paper of uh, Georgios Siliopoulos. Thank you, University of Athens, Dialectic in Proclus and the Unity of Philosophical Disciplines. So you may start now. So we are okay this time for regarding the technical aspects. My Very nice screen is on your screens. So, uh, first of all, I would like to stress the importance of this major figure of late Neoplatonism. There's not much to say among uh, specialists in any case. Uh, I have the purpose to concretely examine the relation on, or the balance between Platonic and uh, Aristotelian elements in Proclus's thoughts, regarding, first of all, the dialectic. Uh, so we will attempt to highlight a certain part of Proclus's work regarding the reception of Plato's dialectic alongside with concrete Aristotelian elements. Uh, is just a moment. I cannot read my text. This is an issue that has not been sufficiently taken into account so far, and although, or rather, just because it lies beyond the main concern, concerns of researchers in this field, it deserves, in our view, to be studied in as much as it might suggest a rather different viewpoint or even contribute to opening up new perspectives. Is namely in the commentary on the first Alcibiades uh, that Plato's late successor and interpreter develops a certain conception regarding the propedeutic and pu purifying role of dialectic, which on the one hand shed, sheds light on the common discursive praxis within the late academy, and on the other hand, gives us the opportunity to reevaluate its contents according to the underlying and constitutive Platonic, Platonic conception of a firm and indivisible unity of all philosophical disciplines that has essential and not just superficial or secondary practical aspects. Dialectic is notably developed by Plato in the Republican as a method or universally important discipline aiming at achieving the knowledge of the highest principles and objects uh, of knowledge, and especially of the good of Agathon. Accordingly, dialectic as highest discipline presupposes the previous successful appropriation of simpler, albeit demanding levels of knowledge, the mathematical sciences in general, 
which are supposed to serve as the firm fundament of what must follow thereafter. In this sense, dialectic proves to be a special and at the same time comprehensive discipline. Uh, this means concretely that the distinction between qualitatively different levels of thought is inconceivable without the evident and inseparable connection with the ontological and pedagogical dimensions of the dialectic. Its ontological and at the same time epistemological dimension concerns the role of the good as the supreme source of knowledge, the existence of which is clearly, clearly stated as well as the uh, fundamental difficulty to grasp it. The pedagogical aspects are interwoven with the accomplishment of practical political goals for the sake of the city as a whole. The disciples of philosophy who are chosen by the founding authorities according to their suitability for the roles necessary for the eudaimonia of the nice and ideal city-state, Gallipolis, must first successfully go through all intermediate stages in the mastery of knowledge in order to finally become the ruling guardians of the political community as such. This also means that they should be able to come to terms with dialectic in two ways. First, they should not only get familiar with its, with its inherent theoretical contents, but also they should develop the capacity to face dialectical challenges whenever necessary. And dialectical challenges could mean uh, dialogical, discursive, or competitive. Proclus, in his part, reconstructs the Platonic position in an uh, almost orthodox way and thereby stresses the importance of dialectic as a method that proceeds through abstractions, the atom aphoresion, in order to help the intellect of the soul, the psychical moon, achieve the sight of the good. On the other hand, uh, the, the uh, fundamental reservations concerning the full grasp or grasp of the good remain in place, while on the other hand, this reservation, reservation remain in place. It thus becomes obvious that in as much Proclus attaches great value and importance to dialectic, he takes a decisive step towards bridging the gap between the subject and the object he had himself previously implied. His stance to dialectic should nevertheless be sufficiently clarified because of some traces of ambiguity inherent to it, for he asserts on the, on the one hand the overall superiority of dialectic, while on the other hand he seems to explicitly confine it to a discursive level suitable for opening up the minds of the disciples of philosophy. This means in addition to it, uh, that uh, dialectic as such is determined as a field of philosophical activity lacking the capacity to transcend certain limitations of the concepts in use, and therefore to ascend to the culmination of the valuable goals of philosophy that is conceived of as a broad realm of knowledge in inseparable connection with ethical principles. Uh, so we should not repeat yet uh, now this uh, orientation. Yes. So within this framework, dialectic appears as a resumption of the Socratic art of disputation because it takes as its starting point the dubious and mostly erroneous belief of its Hearers, that's uh, something comparable to the Aristotelian endoxa in topics, in order to proceed through universally valid conceptions familiar to them to the refutation of the initially and provisionally accepted erroneous beliefs, whereas its final conclusions are supposed to lie beyond any doubt. In order to achieve its ends, dialectic uses explicitly the structure of 
deductive inference and resorts to common concepts at the beginning of the whole procedure, a purifying, pedagogical, and clarifying, and illuminating procedure. It seems, therefore, quite evident uh, that on the one hand, Proclus's dialectic is in accordance with Plato's Republic directed at the highest principles and objects of knowledge. On the other hand, the Aristotelian components become obvious as regards the conception and development of techniques enabling better insights by the persons involved in the academic discourse. The peculiar and interesting symbiosis of Platonic and Aristotelian elements that characterizes the dialectic in Proclusis uh, should not in Proclus, uh, should, should not make us underestimate the fact that the underlying intention of the whole project sketched remains essentially Platonic for dialectic in this context is not perceived just as a study of mechanisms mechanisms of organized discourse on debatable issues. That is, this is the case with uh, the Aristotelian topics, but uh, according to Proclus, this dialectic is uh, developed as a concrete way of achieving the eminently pedagogical and socio-politically relevant goal of the purification of the soul and its gradual initiation into the superior knowledge of the first principle. Uh, and this echoes uh, some traces of uh, the way Proclus had read Plato's Sophist. What Proclus uh, seems to believe about the amelioration of the soul through dialectic is essentially in accordance with his general conception of the processes that characterize it. As he puts it again in his Alcibiades commentary, there are two levels of the soul, the one that in principle resembles the intellect, news, and by virtue of this very fact, it has the capacity to finally become self-sufficient. On the other hand, there is this soul that resembles the body and consequently partakes in the experiences experiences of the body, but just seeking its own goods in things that lie outside itself. Uh, that is uh, superficial things of everyday life and things of material origin. The itinerary of this kind of soul can ultimately lead not uh, lead the soul not to uh, the self-sufficiency, but to an illusory, uh, illusory semblance, phantasma of it. In Proclus's treatises, intellect uh, might mean the two different things that stated in the valuable introduction of Radic Loop. The concept that pervades and unifies the fundamental distinction of the two kinds of the soul is the concept of its self motion in connection with its concrete manifestation. This means the soul per se is self moved autokinitos, but through association with the body, it begins to acquire traits of it and thus to be partially become moved by external factors distinguished by their substantial relative or relative otherness. Uh, what is here at stake is the preservation of the self movement movement as such as a noble quality of the soul. In epistemological terms, the attainment of the uh, Self-motion amounts to the development of the capacity of self-reflection. This self-reflection is uh, equal to also to a self-reversion uh, of the soul at a completely conscious level or state. On the basis of the fundamental distinctions pertaining to it, dialectic as a whole enables the attainment of the necessary equilibrium between different levels of being and its mental and at the same time practical appropriation. Or in any case, this is a quote from Alcibiades' commentary, we must guard the due limits of the soul and neither transfer to its accounts of perfection derived from corporeal things, nor, uh, nor 
put drug down to its level, uh, those derived from divine entities. If we want to interpret properly the Platonic philosophy without reducing the philosophers, that is Plato's words to our own conceptions. And to conclude, we maintain that by concretely studying the way Proclus conceives of dialectic in connection with practical aims, it could become possible to explicitly determine the relations between the various partial field fields of his philosophy and to shed new lights on certain questions concerning the overall orientation of his thought within the broad context of late Neoplatonism. So, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm glad to receive you. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, we, we will proceed with questions. Uh, if you please answer your. Uh, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. The first question, please. Good yes, please. Yes, uh, Georgios, yes. thank you. Thank you for a fascinating paper. I wonder what you think, because you, you didn't, um, you mentioned it at the beginning, but then didn't have time to um, to bring out the question of the relationship between Platonic dialectic and then Aristotelian, major Aristotelian elements in Proclus's mm -hmm. thought. If we think of the problem of the reconciliation of Plato and Aristotle in late antiquity, particularly from Porphyry on, how would you see this relation between these two streams of thought in Proclus? Yes, I, I had uh, said some words about it at the beginning and skipped it. Uh, in general, uh, I think, and you will agree with me, uh, at this level, uh, if we compare uh, mainly Proclus with uh, Plotinus, we see in both cases a fusion of Platonic and Aristotelian elements. But uh, in the long run, um, Plotinus operates with uh, much Aristotelic material of Aristotelian origin, while uh, Proclus is more favorable to Plato. And my, uh, um, my paper, as far as it concerns, uh, I refer to the integration uh, in Proclus's thoughts in this early, at this early stage of the deductive elements of uh, Aristotle, uh, which uh, had been anticipated in Plato, of course, but they were more developed by Aristotle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question? So there seems to be no other question. We can proceed. At, uh, in any case, you can mail your your remarks or questions to the to the schools. That goes for every speaker. So the next. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Iliopoulos. The next speaker is uh, Gina Papalexiou from the University of Thessaloniki. Uh, she's going to speak about the closure of the Platonic Academy in late antiquity. Uh, Mrs. Papalexiou, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Thessaloniki. Um, my presentation uh, is about the closure of the Platonic Academy in late uh, antiquity. Well, the refugees of uh, the Platonic Academy, the first organized philosophical uh, institution in the core of the history of philosophy in late antiquity, but mainly the last phase of its impact is the issue of my historical philosophical presentation. 
and no other school during uh, classical Hellenistic and later antiquity could be compared with in terms of its general axis as an educational research center. The course of the academy reflects uh, not only the intellectual status of its period, but uh, also the influence of uh, Platonic philosophy in the history of philosophy. Over time, changes in the history cultural level affect the alternation of philosophical periods leaving a very strong mark in philosophy. The relationship between ancient Greek philosophy and Christianity, the political cultural uh, reclassifications, the emergence of new theoretical issues, philosophical and theological, had a peculiar reflection in philosophy, creating an interesting setting in late antiquity. The defining dependence of philosophy on the border and the broader cultural, geopolitical and geoeconomic contexts was evident in the course of the Platonic Academy. Each course in the following years and the philosophical peculiarities reflect in depth. First, the reception of uh, the Platonic philosophy in the philosophical thought and Christian theology. Second, the decisive confrontation of the new cultural burden to classical antiquity. The Greco-Roman culture influenced, as expected, the character of the philosophical thought, opening the gates of the last phase of antiquity which at the level of philosophical current was sailed mainly by Neoplatonism and at the level of a historical event with philosophical significance, of course, by the closure of the Academy. Late antiquity is the first reflection of classical times in philosophical thought in a period of intense political, religious, cultural and political rearrangements. Philosophical thinking during this period between the third and the sixth uh, century Anno Domini, acquires internal experiential, uh, experiential character. The basic philosophical heritage is Platonism, Aristotelianism and Stoicism. This period is characterized mainly by the emergence of uh, Christian and non-Christian thinkers. Despite the differences, we could say that their reflection was about a principle philosophical and Plotinus, or religious God um, Christian thinkers with a cognitive and moral coverage. We notice here the, uh, various uh, nuances of approach in this much discussed uh, topic. The Stoics are closer to the connection between moral and divine command, the Epicureans are more distant. The philosophical framework of knowledge depends on the revelation of a different truth from that sought by the pure philosophical research of the classical period of ancient Greek philosophy. In this confrontation, the attitude towards Platonism is decisive. Platonism is the ground on which the various philosophical currents will develop and evolve. Uh, it would not be unreasonable to mention here Rorty's view that uh, Platonism and philosophy are identical. A view criticized by Professor Lloyd Gershor in um, Platonism and Naturalism, the possibility of philosophy, of course, in this context. Neoplatonism, the most important philosophical current of this period, brings the seeds of the, view of the new, even though it is inscribed in the above attempt to interpret the Platonic work. We notice a contradiction here. Although the dominant philosophical orientation of the last phase of late antiquity is the Neoplatonic one, which is also represented uh, by the Academy, the leading institution is going through a very serious crisis, which lead to its closure. More importantly, we have to notice that philosophical political quests culminate in issues of internal freedom, the elaboration of which is an individual matter, which is sold in the city. They turn into individual existential issues. The need for regulatory law is greater than ever. This need will be realized in time by Justinian. In the first period of the Academy, the most influential philosophical groups are, of course, Stoics and Epicureans. Skepticism will affect also the Academy. Gradually, Neoplatonism and Neopythagoreanism made their appearance. Neopythagoreanism between 1st and 3rd uh, century anatomy will turn to a peculiar asceticism and contact with the divine demonstrating the Pythagorean conception of classical ancient Greek philosophy. The operation of the academy continued after the Hellenistic years in parallel with the three major philosophical curates, Stoicism, Epicureanism and Skepticism. 
the self-evident political support of philosophical thought, which neutered the classical era, the city-state, is already beginning to be shaken during Hellenistic times. The traditional uh, context of the Greek city-state, according to François Satellet, this appears to be replaced by an empire. The philosopher loses the primacy of, class of classical times in terms of the articulation of political discourse. In the Hellenistic and Roman years, individual ethics developed, the, institu the institutions, especially the rule of law, are in crisis. The tendency towards the self-determination of human behavior, not understood in the context of uh, self-consciousness, of course, as a result of theoretical elaboration, Nicomachean ethics, politics, but also the adoption of practices, was the achievement in the classical era, where the occasional condition is not degraded, but is a part of the consideration according to which the philosophical subject lives not only in nature, but also in history, being aware of his mission. In late antiquity, however, the dominant philosophical current is Neoplatonism. Philosopher, Philosophers of this era received in a different, different way for each one influences of Platonism, Aristotelianism, Neopythagorism. Neoplatonism also receiving influences from the way of thinking of the East, the new religious environment, and her reflecting on the Christian dogma and the philosophical ideas. The triptych that marked the course of philosophy during this period was the ancient Greek philosophy of the classical period mainly, which continued to inspire its thinkers. Second, the fermentation religious, cultural, philosophical that took place in the East. The dominant point of reference is the emergence of Neoplatonism, but also great philosophical personalities originating from the East. And third, Christianity. These three axes will decisively influence the philosophical thinking and the philosophical production of this period. Of course, this is not a sterile confrontation between Platonism and Christianity or philosophy and religion. After all, there has never been a single manifestation of Platonism. Neoplatonism differs from Platonism of earlier periods. But also the theoretical elaboration on the Christian religion intensified mainly in late uh, antiquity, uh, especially after the first ecumenical council in Nicaea. Such uh, confrontations in the history of philosophy are, broad, are broader and more complex. Christianity was conceptually based on the ancient Greek philosophical thought, namely the Platonic one. The logical character of the concept, Platonic dialectic, loses its primacy. The freedom in the civil rights, the organization and structure of the state as they are dealt with in Plato's Republic, the emergence and elaboration of political issues, Plato's uh, statesman, uh, Aristotle's politics, which until then were its central joints philosophical discourse, are degraded. The transition from the skeptical profile of the academy to the neoplatonic was one of the major historical philosophical reasons that contributed to the closure of the academy. In the background, the change in the epistemological moral level of philosophical thought propounded cosmogenic changes. The transition from the absolute questioning of knowledge to the insightful, ecstatic knowledge was a long way. It was expected that uh, at the end of this uh, trip, uh, the academy could not stand it. Skepticism has been a healthy philosophical reaction to Stoicism and, more generally, a vigilant philosophical view of the epistemological question. Its contribution to the epistemological issue was decisive and many times beneficial in the history of philosophy in all its uh, versions and manifestations from Piro of Elsie of Elis to Descartes. Skepticism, for the most part, set free the mind in the question of approaching philosophical issues. On the other hand, we cannot ignore the fact that constant questioning does not work ex um, exponentially for the curious spirit. Other ways of philosophical research were expected to be requested. In the background, the closure of the academy marked the end of the ancient world. Although its last phase was not uh, reminiscent of its beginning, its neoplatonic term was in perfect harmony with the new facts of the time, the influence of religion 
and Eastern thought. However, when Damasius took over, uh, the course of the academy had already become decline. The academy, however, closes during the heyday of Neoplatonism, the most interesting moment in the approach of the Platonic work. This term has the following characteristics. First, theoretically, it is closer to the legacy of Plato. The good has a transcendental character, but also to the Stoics, identification of nature with God, the inwardness of the divine. Uh, as second, this combination, instead of highlighting a new phase of the academy, will be the internal final blow that academy will receive in its philosophical foundations. At the same time, however, this new ring highlighted an indisputable cultural reality, unexpectedly philosophically, but realistic. The synthesis of the Greek spirit with ideas of the East, which have characteristics of introversion. This is obvious from the philosophical issues that uh, characterized this uh, period, the eternity of the world. This relation in Christianity will take the form of created, uncreated, histon actiston, the connection of knowledge with um, supersensible entities, etc. The moral practical orientation of the new religion, the genius connection of power and religion, as expressed by Justinian, and the religious absorption of non-Christian Neoplatonism in eternal quests created the background of the end. A, ser a series of uh, seemingly minor events contributed to this, also undermined by prestige of the academy, such as the exile or self-exile of the no-platonic uh, philosopher Proclus from Athens due to, the uh, due to the opposition of Christian thinkers, but also the war uh, against Aegeas, a prominent figure of the academy who never took the reins of the institution. So one further point to know is uh, the importance of this philosophical historical context the controversy between Christian and non-Christian thinkers. We assume that the whole thing, on the one hand, was a religious matter, survival of Christianity in a hostile world. On the other hand, was philosophical. Uh, there were not the irresistible philosophical status of the classical period of ancient philosophy, and the Christian religion had not yet developed all its theoretical aspects, so that it, uh, it felt safe and unshakable. The last period of the Academy, 6th uh, century Anadomini, manages to incorporate the ancient Greek heritage in the new cultural and political data and to open an interesting dialogue between philosophy, mainly Platonic and Aristotelian, and religion, which distinguish intelligent philosophical approaches which open open new paths, Plotinus, uh, which will lead to Byzantine philosophy, which according to the prevailing uh, version develops from the closure of the acad academy onwards. It was necessary to close the cycle of the old to open the new. Uh, besides, this characterizes the eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech, Mr. Alexiu. And we proceed with the questions. Uh, please. This is uh, Robin Waterfield speaking. I have a question. Yes, please. Gina, thank you. Oh. That was great. Um, I want to try to tempt you away from strict philosophy. I've got a couple of sort of historical questions. Um, do, do you have an opinion on, do you know, was the academy still physically located? I mean, okay, we know we know they left the academy grove after Sulla sacked Athens, and we know um, Antiochus of Ascalon later used the Ptolemaeum Gymnasium in Athens as mm. his uh, base. Where was it by the time of these, uh, you know, Justinian's closure? Was, was was did it still have a physical location, or was it just being taught out of people's homes? Or do do you know? Do we know? Uh, I think uh, this is um, a very interesting uh, question uh, for um, history of philosophy, um, or just for history. Uh, 
we know that uh, the academy, we certainly know that the academy uh, was located in the great uh, gymnasium in Kolonos, um, mm. at least uh, till the Hellenistic era. Um, from uh, Hellenistic era to late antiquity, um, we don't know for sure if there is uh, a building institution uh, organized in the way uh, that organized in past. This is my opinion. No, that, that confirms what, I, what I've been reading and thinking anyway. Do we know another sort of slightly related question? Okay, after Justinian's decree in 529, um, do we know how long it took to take effect? Do we know that, that, you know, philosophers stopped teaching in Athens straight away? I mean, for instance, the Olympic Games seem to have trickled on for a couple of decades after Justinian's decree or edict, whatever one should call it. Um, do we know, I mean, was there still teaching going on, let's say up till 550, 560 in Athens, near Pla Neoplatonic teaching? We know that in 531, um, a mission about uh, six, five uh, philosophers uh, uh, had a trip, uh, a philosophical trip uh, um, in uh, East, uh, so um, right, yeah. they did. They, they, they but uh, they weren't uh, uh, very pleased about uh, the reception there, or uh, the the the, uh, the way that uh, uh, East uh, uh, King East uh, will uh, uh, were um, proceed this. Uh, uh, their philosophy, so they come back, uh, most of them. Um, this means that uh, they didn't have the opportunity to teach uh, right. um, or to teach what they want to teach. Yeah, so it effectively stopped in Athens at that point. Yeah, it's not in Athens, but uh, I think it was, uh, I think that uh, in Alexandria we have yeah. a, a, a great con continue. Okay, this is another part of uh, yeah, yeah, Neoplatonic. Sure. Okay, thanks. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add a few things, we have a degree that concerns the law school in Athens, and we presume that concerns also the philosophical school. But uh, the whole matter is very obscure. They left Athens, those philosophers, but they probably came back and they taught in Constantinople. So we are not really, if it is a philosophical legend, a fact. Uh, we don't know if uh, where it was situated, the, the, the school. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a rather uh, no, not clear business, all this. Could could you um could you email me the details of that decree, please? I think we find it. Sorry, in the, histori in the historiography of John John Zonaras. Oh and right, okay. There is and a... John Malalas also. Malalas, not Zonaras. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I thought you meant Malalas. <laughs> the chronic. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, another question. So let's go on. As we said before, you can mail your questions and remarks to the speaker. Thank you, Mrs. Papalexiu, very much. And we Thank continue. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with Mr. Dimitrios Vasilakis, University of Athens, who will speak about love and platonic descent, some consequences in Proclus and Dionysius. Uh, if you please. Mr. Vasilakis, take the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Very well. Good. So uh, let me once more please uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Anagnosto, Professor Stiris, Professor Arabatis, uh, you for this uh, uh, event. It is an honor for me to be uh, uh, partaking in this conference. So let me start. Philosophical literature's most famous descent stems from Plato's Republic's Cave simile. Its Christian counterpart is both Christ's incarnation and the resurrection, 
which in Byzantine iconography is depicted as descent to Hades. Despite similarities, there are differences between the philosophers and Christ's descent. That is, in the Christian case, the humiliation encapsulated in the descent is a characteristic of the Son of Righteousness, i.e. of God himself. In Plato's case, the Son illuminating the philosopher's vision does not descend. It is the philosopher who descends to the cave, functioning as a mediator between under and outer world, humanity and divinity, like the symposium's errors. In what follows, I will juxtapose ethical consequences arising from these two versions of descent, looking at some examples from the pagan Neoplatonic appropriation of the Platonic cave assembly in Proclus Alcibiades' commentary and from a Christian counterpart in Dionysius' eighth epistle. Common denominator is the connection of descent with love. I begin with a remarkable Proclean passage. Quote, Socrates, at any rate, is full of the good and the beautiful, and offers the young man, i.e. Alcibiades, communication in the virtues. He descends, catechism, as it were, to activity in relation to another, and proceeds from his inner life to a movement lower in the scale of being, in order that, like Hercules, he may lead up his beloved from Hades and persuade him to withdraw from the life of appearance." End of quote. This passage manifests Proclus' wondrous allegorical sensitivity for recognizing Platonic patterns, i.e. the catavasis, into the cave, as anticipated in Greek culture's mythical background, and calls for the above-mentioned parallel with Christ's descent to Hades. Elsewhere, I have explicated the passage's metaphysics and terminology. I would now like to draw our attention to a problematic feature of Neoplatonic erotic providence. In the context of the discussion as to why Socrates' guardian spirit allowed him to associate with Alcibiades, or that it could foresee that the young man would not be finally benefited, Proclus concludes thus, quote, the phrase, so I persuade myself, from uh, the uh, first Alcibiades, seems to me to show clearly that the divinely inspired lover, if he sees the beloved suited for conversion to intellect, to intellect helps him in so far as he is able. But if he finds him small-minded and ignoble and concerned with things below, he, that is the lover, turns back to himself and looks towards himself alone, taking refuge in the proverbial, I saved myself, End of quote. From this description, it turns out that the divine lover is not much troubled about the other person and his or her perfection. Of course, we should not uh, lay too much weight on the slightly surprising use of the proverbial I saved myself, because the lover, for example Socrates, regardless of his beloved's fate, is already saved. After all, Socrates does not need Alcibiades in order to recollect the intelligible. The point is that the beloved's failure does not have any impact on the ataraxia of the lover's internal and self-directed activity. Perhaps then the lover was not interested in being providential for the beloved's sake, but rather for the activity's sake, since providence is necessarily intentional. Although the beloved is not a necessary requirement for the divine lover's self-realization, he is reduced to a means for the manifestation of the lover's self-realization. Hence, Alcibiades assumes the place of the preferred indifferent for the stoic-like sage Socrates. The preferred indifferent forms only a target so that the sage can perform a virtuous action, no matter whether the target is accomplished, the actual target lying within the virtuous activity. I now move to Dionysius' more frugal metaphysics, focusing on a vision that recalls both Christ's descent and Bible's parable of judgment. It also has similarities with Hercules and Socrates' aforementioned descent. The eighth epistle is the most enticing among Dionysius' ten epistles. Qua distinctive part of his corpus, they form a whole hierarchically structured. The recipient of the first epistle is a monk, while of the final one, a theologian, St. John. Only the eighth epistle's recipient, Demophilus, a lover of the many, like Alcibiades, breaks the hierarchy because in this way Dionysius mirrors the letter's content, 
why and how one should not break the hierarchy. Demophilus judged that the priest, by being meek towards a sinner, full of penitence, had sinned and should not enter the altar. Dionysius criticized Demophilus in two ways. A. Christ himself was meek, roused, and called us to love even our enemies. Hence, Demophilus stands against the priest was false, because it was bereft of meekness, while presumably the priest was not mistaken. B. Even if the priest were wrong, Demophilus should not violate the hierarchy, criticizing a higher member of the church. He should let the priest's peers or higher members do this because, one, the closer in the hierarchy we get to God, the more light one receives from God in order to illuminate others. Second, even if a hierarch is unsuccessful in this work, it is safe to wait that some other illumined member will intervene in order to align things with God's will. Like with the final myths of Platonic dialogues, the letter ends with a vision which illustrates how the hierarchy's top, the humble and meek Christ acts. The context is similar to that of Demophilus' framing story. Carpos, a holy man in Crete, was upset by two men's sinful behavior and envisaged them as being in a chasm, in fact an image of hell, with serpents trying to drag them down. He was delighting because it seemed a just punishment. However, mankind's man, uh, manic lover did not think so. When Carpos looked up, quote, Jesus had risen from his heavenly throne. Moved by compassion, he came down, Catavanda, to the unfaithful too. He reached a rescuing hut out to them. The angels helped him. He held on to the two men, one on either side of him. Then Jesus said to Carpos, So, your hand is raised up raised up, and I now am the one you must hit. Here I am, ready once again to suffer for the salvation of man, and I would very gladly endure it if in this way I could keep men from sin. Look to yourself." End of quote. In this remarkable experience, like Hercules, Christ descends to a chasm reminiscent either of hell or Plato's fairy cave in order to save two persons. As with Adam and Eve, in the Resurrection's icon, Christ gives his hand to the sinners, which is a symbol of man's potentiality to become God, since God became man. Does not God-likeness God -likeness threaten hierarchy? The epistle shows us that although an upwards violation of the hierarchy is forbidden, a downwards violation is product of the hierarchy itself. Christ descends in order to take on him the two people's sins. His descent is not an attenuated image of divine providence, as in Socrates or Hercules' case, but divine erotic providence par excellence. Thus, hierarchy is not static, but dynamic. It persists, persists in so far as its members can descend, in order to save those further apart from the sun, so that they become as sun-like as possible. Sign that one has approached God likeness is his or her uh, is his or her identification with those in need who descend to their level, as Christ does in Carpus' vision and the judgment parable. This is why, in contrast to Christ's helping hand, Carpus hand and guest against the sinners ended up being against Christ himself. Concluding, if descent is not providences remote by product, as in Proclus Neoplatonism, but the essence of ecstatic providence, then the divine lover, while impossible, will never, quote from Proclus, turn back and look towards himself alone, end of quote. For Dionysius, descent to Hades, where resurrection happens every now and forever. Thank you very much, and I'm waiting for your comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Vasilakis. We can proceed to questions. Yes, please.
Well, I have a question. Uh, it's a general question. How one can remedy the dissent? Uh, he can only follow the, the opposite uh, direction. Is this sufficient? Or he has to do other things also? Uh, what do you think about that? Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, you're referring also to the issue of the fall, ptosis, because exactly you said how to remedy this dissent. So uh, it is very interesting, actually, uh, also in some other writings uh, of mine, I, I examined this. So we have two versions of dissent. So let's say the one is the ptosis, a negative one, and the other is uh, the positive one, this dissent when one wants to help others. Now, of course, uh, in Neoplatonism, so this ptosis, this fall is characteristic also of the Christian ontology. In uh, uh, Neoplatonism uh, of Plotinus or Proclus, of course, we have this, um, uh, uh, let's say, dangerous attention of the soul towards uh, matter, but uh, we have also this providence that higher deities or also good like souls can show by being uh, uh, providential to what lies below them. So I would say that both in Neoplatonism and Christianity have upwards attention. So this, uh, uh, this movement towards the good, let's say, has some consequences, providential, uh, let's say, care for what lies below. So, uh, let's say that one can remedy a descent again by a descent, but a descent that it is providential for uh, what lies uh, below. So, both in Neoplatonism and Christianity, one can remedy, I would say, this form, but this does not exclude, again, a downwards, a downwards orientation of one's attention and care. Although, of course, I try to show that there are some differences between uh, the providential love of uh, Socrates, so the ideal of uh, Proclus, and uh, Christ, the ideal of Dionysius. Okay, thank you. Another question? So, as we did Can before... Ask something? Yes, please. Just out of, out of sheer ignorance, actually. And maybe this is a silly question, but you'll tell me, uh, Dimitri. When platonic love is rediscovered in the West, or the concept of platonic love is rediscovered in the West. People are seriously concerned. They are reading, of course, first the symposium and then Phaedrus. Um, and the homosexual aspects of these dialogues shock them. It always puzzles me how in Christianity, platonic love is adopted in an almost organic and continuous way without anyone worrying too much about the homosexual aspects uh, of the platonic love is it because they just pass it over in silence or do they find another way of dealing with it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh yes so uh, we know sometimes when uh proclus has uh, some interpretive uh, problems so he just uh, gives an allegory and uh, things are solved so i don't think that the Christians um, have done this. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, what prevails is um, uh, the hermeneutics of St. Basil, that one should take uh, what is precious from uh, uh, other traditions, uh, especially the ancient Greek tradition, and of course, uh, let some things that are uh, negative aside. So, I think um, this is one aspect. The second aspect is that um, uh, in the symposium, also in the Phaedrus, it's not that we have just homosexual love. We have this, but framed within a pedagogical uh, scheme. 
And I think that that uh, was uh, very enticing to the Christians also in the monast uh, monastics, uh, monastic uh, circles. So we have uh, the Vegeron, uh, the Starets, and then uh, the other monks, for example. And here again, we have, of course, uh, the same sex, for example. So uh, I would say that the Christians, as with the many other uh, examples, of uh, dealing with the ancient culture, they took some things and they baptized them in order to use them in their uh, own uh, framework. But to be honest, I think that this also uh, shows that perhaps some of them were more open-minded than perhaps we today, in that they were ready to uh, endorse um, uh, some elements that, at least on the surface, would seem strange to them. Thank you. I would expect the same from their Latin counterparts, but it kind of shocked me that they didn't. May I add something in brief? Uh, this, yes, this, this pedagogical aspect is uh, uh, did something I, I should have said myself. It's a, and also uh, one thing, Mr. Pavlos also yeah. is asking a question. We, we will follow you. It's a uh, justification of the uh, pedagogical uh, dimension of dialectic that it uh, uses the uh, arts amatoria erotica. I don't know the. Uh, if, if there's an established English term, but this uh, way of dealing with uh, love in a proper way, with uh, in, as much as you know, one keeps the value of things and neglects the others, is, a, is a crucial to this pedagogical and also uh, epistemological procedure. And so there's an interconnection between love. Uh, our sanatorium dialectic and midwifery also the Alcibiades commentary. Okay. Exactly. Thank you very much. Ed. It is very interesting to show to see in Proclus that actually uh, all these activities are also uh, to do with the recipients of uh, this activity. So, for example, Alcibiades uh, uh, might be uh, fit for uh, erotics, but uh, Theaetetus, for example, for meiotics. And then we see how these all uh, tie together. And actually, we saw how good Socrates, a teacher, was. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Dimitri, for uh, your very interesting paper. Just a very quick question. Um, you mentioned that um, in the case of the, well, in the Neoplatonic setting, the, 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 the case of the fall implies or describes the fall of the soul into matter, into the bodily, the limitations. I wonder uh, how one should interpret such a notion of the fall uh, within a creation out of nothing scheme where you don't have eternity. And so the soul doesn't fall from anywhere and the matter besides is not existing from before, but it is simultaneously uh, made up with the soul. Uh, thank you very much, Panayoti, uh, for this very interesting um, uh, question. Yeah, it's true. It's true that uh, we use this um, uh, special, so in terms of space, these uh, images, and perhaps sometimes um, uh, they might be not um, uh, very uh, concrete or uh, correct. I think that um, in the Christian uh, framework, framework, of course, it's not, it is not only metaphysics, but of course, the ethical aspect that is important. And I think that uh, in any case, if our axis, our center is, um, is caught, this fall means that uh, one goes uh, uh, far away from this center of life, which is God. And then, of course, this means that one has some uh, consequences. For example, we have death and so on and so on. So uh, perhaps because in Christianity and 
Neoplatonism, especially the Plotinian branch of Neoplatonism, we don't have the same kind of hierarchy, I would say, in ontological terms. This is why um, uh, a notion of the fall in the uh, Neoplatonic um, scheme of reality would be perhaps more uh, intelligible or more easily depictable in an image than the, this notion in the context of Christianity. I don't know if this is enough. I thank you, Pandit. So we don't have any more time. Thank you very much, Mr. Vasilakis. We'll I thank you. The next uh, speaker, Mr. Dionysis Cleris from the University of Athens, who will speak about Neoplatonist influences of, of analogical participation, the thought of St. Maximus the Confessor. Mr. Scleris, please, you can begin. Thank you very much, dear Professor, and I would also like to thank all the organizers for this very interesting um, conference and for the opportunity to participate in it. I will now I will speak about the analogical participation and Maximus. So I will now share my PowerPoint presentation. I'm sorry. Share uh, content. Ah, there it is. I'm sorry. Sir. Very sir. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, uh, do you see the the PowerPoint? Is it okay? Yes. 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 We Thank you. So, first of all, as an introduction, I would like to point out that uh, I would like to name. St. Maximus project as Chalcedonian participation, that is a, partici a philosophy of participation based on the Chalcedonian dogma of the full divine and human nature of Christ. And I'd like to point out that uh, there is a common philosophical project between Neoplatonism and Christianity, uh, which is based in uh, participation in transcendence. But admitting the possibility of such a combination required a bold reformation of Platonism that could oppose some of its basic tenets and negate some of its intuitions. Um, I will proceed to the second slide. Unlike the Neoplatonic Trinity, the Christian Trinity shares in the same ontological alterity in relation to the world without a natural hierarchy. And this absolute transcendence and full participation run in tandem. If there is no natural relation between God and the world, then there is no privileged part of created nature in the participation of the divine. The body is a candidate for methexis, at least as much as the intellect. This is the meaning of Chalcedonian participation, namely, the fact that man does not need to leave something aside when he or she participates in God, but can include his full hypostasis in this ecstasy. In this view, evil is not being, but it is not detected in one particular ontological domain. It is rather something that emerges in history from voluntarily severing the beings from their source. So I would name these three aspects of this project as egalitarian trinitarianism with a natural gap in relation to the world or trinity without hierarchy secondly participation including the body and thirdly the notion of evil as non-being yet in a de-reified way in other words a non-identification of evil with matter uh, i will uh, skip this part for reasons of time uh, the Possible philosophical source of St. Maximus' thought are the mostly the Alexandrinian uh, um, philosophers like uh, Stephanus, Elias, and David, and through them St. Maximus knows uh, John Philoponus, 
but also there is a patristic mediation through Gregory of Nyssa, Nemesis of Emesa, Saint Cyril, etc. And there seems to be familiarity with the Neoplatonic school of Athens, namely Proclus, Damasius, and Simplicius. Um, in this part of the paper, uh, I would like to point out that uh, there is a Trinitarian theology of uh, a Christian one of intellect, logos or reason, and pneuma or spirit. This, uh, this is a psychological Trinitarian theology, but it has some Neoplatonic influences, but it is not identical to Neoplatonism. According to this Trinitarian structure, uh, there is hum the human soul is considered as an image of the divine trinity, as it comprises the intellect, the reason, but also speech, discourse, verb, language, and the spirit, which is also the breath, the breath or the voice. So man can undertake a dialogue with God, and uh, just as God possesses the logos who manifests divine being, in the same sense, man can be expressed and manifested through his own logos. This dialogue takes place at the level of contingent historical modes through which the created nature is activated. But the human logos is also a natural power or faculty, which is an indispensable presupposition. Uh, now I reach the main part of my paper concerning the analogical participation. So this uh, dialogical notion of participation, which is based in a correspondence between the divine trinity and the human trinity, is based on a more rudimentary ontology, according to which, uh, firstly, God in himself is above being, secondly, the divine activities or energies constitute an ontological realm around God, where being proper, as well as eternity, simplicity, goodness, infinity, etc., are to be found. Uh, so being is, an, is in a domain between God and the world, so to speak. And thirdly, created beings lack being because they are constantly threatened by non-being. Maximus' particularly Christian outlook is that the participation of created beings in being proper is an activity of the transcendent God which happens through Christ and the hypostatic union. Now I turn to the Maximian use of the Neoplatonic uh, theme of remaining, procession and return. The procession is primarily a procession of divine energies, since beings in themselves are only results of these energies, ex nihilo. Secondly, this return in Maximus acquires a historical, Christological, and eschatological character. Namely, the logo of beings point to the manifestation of God's will in the eschaton, they are situated in the Logos, in the center Christ realizes the raison d'etre of created nature through his incarnation, the full ontological consequences of which will only be manifested in the eschaton. The Logos divine wills also mean the way in which particular natural capacities are assumed by the incarnated Christ. Thus, inside history, the wise man, the philosophers, is invited to discern the Logoi, that is, the divine wills behind creatures, and to conform his or her life to them, thus participating in the divine energy that acts through the Logoi. Participation thus leads to deification, which is but the supreme form of participation. As in Neoplatonism, the ontological notion of participation is intermingled with an ethical one, but the latter acquires a historical and eschatological perspective in a way that is arguably foreign to a platonic emphasis on protology. What is now the Maximian notion of energia? Saint Maximus wishes to formulate this itinerary from protology to eschatology in a philosophical idiom. He uses the Aristotelian notion of motion as a passage from potentiality to actualization, but in an eclectic way, he combines it with a Neoplatonic conception of the divine efficient cause of motion. 
The final goal of motion of movement is participation in God, but in order to understand this, one has to study first the polysemy of the notion of energia, since the participation of beings in God is considered as tantamount to God being active and operating in beings. The energia can mean the actualization of a being's capacities, like in Aristotle, and as such, it can also mean the natural constitutive power of nature, that is its first and most particular characteristic, or the one that gives that gives it its specific form. Uh, the natural energy is considered as an innate distinctive mark of nature, and in this sense, essence is constituted by the proper energy of a being. Uh, sometimes the Maxinian notion of energy is closer to the Plotinian one, as it means the productive natural power or capacity. Um, now I followed Professor Thorstein Tollefsen's reading, according to which um, we can better understand Maximus if we consider the Plotinian theory of double activity, the internal activity of each being in its actuality, and the external activity is dependent on the internal one, but it's also distinct, and it is a power that manifests the essence. It is a natural movement by which the essence is participated. In God, the internal activity is unknown, but the external one is participated by created beings. But unlike Plotinus, the bridging forth of the cosmos is not an incidental result. God, who is unmovable by nature, can even be said to move out of love for the beings he creates. In an unexpected Maximian, but also Dionysian, twist of Hellenic philosophy, Thus, in the Maximian schema of remaining, procession, and return, God's activity is exercised to creation through the Logoi that are volitional utterances for the creation, the providence, and the eschatological future of created beings. As I move now to the analogical participation in the notion of fitness. Uh, the divine energy is considered as a whole in which beings participate according to logical principles limiting their, their receptive capacity. God is both active everywhere as a whole, in a common way, he knows, but also he is also active in a particular manner in each different being, in the azondos. This is the meaning of analogical participation, which is uh, corresponding to analogical activity of God. The sheer act of being is already a participation in the divine activity, but also there's a second level in which beings with the capacity of self-movement after exusion can participate more fully according to their deliberate fitness, epitidiotis. What are the philosophical sources of this? Uh, the notion of fitness was introduced by the commentators of Aristotle in late antiquity exactly as an amelioration of the Sagirite's doctrine of potency and actualization, since the commentators have realized that potentiality is a necessary condition for actualization, but not a sufficient one. The scheme of Produs and Epistrophes developed in later Neoplatonists, such as Proclus, stemming from Plotinus' theory about the double activity. In the Proclean version of the Plotinian double activity, every effect remains in its cause, proceeds from it, and converts to it. The effect is brought forward by an activity of the cause that is initially internal. Now I, I come back to St. Maximus. Maximus employs, employs this uh, Proclean terminology, Snectici Produs Epistriptici Anaphora, but in a different meaning. He doesn't share the notion that the effect undergoes a procession and then a conversion and remains in its cause, but for him this happens through the contingent adventure of history and its eschatological fulfillment. The conversion means a free coordination of the motion of intellectual beings with their logos, so the triad is joined to those of Archimesotis Telos, beginning, middle, end, and uh, essence, potentiality, activity. The energy and actualization, as to act in a virtuous way, means 
to initiate the state of virtue, but the final goal transcends this actualization since it is beyond nature. This is a radical novelty and the, in which we find the human nature of Christ that is modified in a divine way. And for Maximus, it does not bring about a change of nature in its logos, but only a change of the mode in the level at the level of its activity. This new conception of activity arguably takes us far from both Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism. Uh, since there is also an eschatological notion particular to the Christian vision of Maximus, according to which the final deification is a rest and the cessation of becoming, but in a paradoxical way, the peak of the natural activity is identical to the passive reception of divinization. At the same time, it is not a restriction of human capacities, but an infinite expansion. This eminent coincidence of activity and passivity in the act of divinization is arguably reminiscent of the Amblichan theurgy. And we have a notion of analogy, of analogical participation also in the eschaton as a mode of disposition. This means that in the eschatology, uh, different persons do not have the possibility to, to act upon their own nature, which is resurrected and... Uh, and uh, immortalized, but they can only influence their personal mode of, uh, of disposition towards this resurrected na nature. And this is the new meaning of analogical participation. And it is also an analogical participation even inside the saved ones. Even inside the saved ones, there's a sort of, let's say, aristocracy in Maximian thought where a more saintly persons have a, a better analogical participation of God. So all the same, they are not exactly equal in participation. So for the sake of time, I'd like to to conclude. Um, we, have, we have thus three notions, participation, analogy, and uh, fitness. What I'd like to point out is that participation, I think, um, it's about uh, the entirety of created uh, beings, even the inanimate uh, nature participates in a way. This is the same for analogy, but fitness is peculiar only to intellectual beings like human persons and angels. But there is, a, of, as I have pointed out, there is an interaction between the notions of fitness and participation. Finally, I'd like to point out that, the, that there is a political aspect of analogical participation. For St. Maximus in, in the Mystagogy, the Ecclesia is the new Platonic uh, city, the new polis or Platonic Republic, and the soul is the image of the Trinity, uh, and uh, the church is the image both of the soul and the trinity in the same way that the city in Plato is the image of the soul. But in St. Maximus we have interconnection between the soul, the ecclesia, but also, the, also God, the divine trinity, which constitutes a profound echo of Neoplatonism in Maximian thought. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chris. We proceed uh, to the questions. If you want to answer your screen. Yes. Uh, stop sharing. Yes. Okay. First question, please. I have a question for Dionysus. Ah, yes. May I ask it? Yes, please. Oh. Thank you very much, Dionysia. Yeah. Uh, it was a very interesting paper, especially for uh, me working on uh, Epididiotis. Yes, uh, of course. Yes. Uh, just a quick comment. I mean, I also tend yes. to use the, the, the term fitness for uh, Epididiotis, mm -hmm. but then after I also have figured out uh, it might be better to use aptitude mm -hmm. instead, which you also aptitude. mentioned. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it is Samburski and uh, Torstein also had taken it from him at that time, but uh, 
after I discussed it with Norman Russell and several other people, we have come to agree that the aptitude is better. Now, my question, um, or twofold question for the first part, um, you said that St. Maximus. Uh, I can hear you. The irrational beings and I not, and not uh, for instance, irrational or the lower levels of being. Because, I mean, in Neoplatonism, we have aptitude. Proclus uses it extensively in the elements of theology where he says that, yes. you know, uh, even the bare being has a natural uh, appetite, which is uh, a kind of natural aptitude. Uh, and also Dionysius, mm takes over this uh, kind of hierarchy of aptitudes. But I'm not yes. sure uh, whether St. Maximus makes a kind of sharp uh, distinction and, 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 and distinguishes between uh, epididiotis as used only for rational beings, whereas participation is more generic and relates to any kind of being. Mm. And the second part of the question, which might be relevant, is if you could be elaborate a bit further on on the analogical participation uh, in what would it be different from but let's say the classic model of participation also in saint maximus thank you uh, thank you thank you very much dr pablos and uh, uh, since you are a specialist on this subject uh, thanks to your phd research uh, I am very thankful for your comments, and uh, my um, my impression is that uh, when I have when I have uh, seen the uses of uh, of the of the terms uh, aptitude that is epididiotis and uh, participation in uh, Saint Maximus, I had uh, the impression. I will now also see my the. I had the impression that uh, the uses of the term epididiotis concern the um, intellectual beings, like human persons, or maybe angels. Whereas the um, I am whether whereas metohin and alogia are used for the entire the entire creation. Um, we can this. Since I don't want to lose time with uh, the um, with the um, uh, text, we can have a a, a, convert, a dialogue through emailing. Uh, I can email you the um, my references. And yes, uh, nice. but uh, I'm very open uh, for a, re a reconsideration. If you think that this distinction is not sharp, I am open for a reconsideration. And secondly, what uh, is the meaning of analogical participation? Uh, the term analogy uh, covers two different things, two distinct things. On the one hand, we have analogy by nature, so it's being like uh, inanimate objects, plants, animals, etc. They have an analogical participation according to their nature. Uh, this is this, in Maximus. This, is, this has a Christological aspect, since Christ is the microcosm of uh, the cosmos of nature through his human nature. So, for example, the analogical participation of uh, inanimate objects through corporeality, or of plants through the vegetative soul animals through the irascible and the desiring part of the soul and hu and finally humans through the intellectual and reasonable soul uh, all of this is an analogical participation through the human nature of christ and then there is a second aspect of analogy which is the analogy uh, according to to the will of persons of intellectual persons and uh, this second notion of analogy also remains in the eschaton. And I think that in St. Maximus, this notion of analogy uh, has a, a sort of, uh, let's say, um, it is a notion of love of God who does not want to be, to have an exclusive, let's say an exclusive club of only some uh, beings that participate in him. 
but he, there is no one way to participate in God. There's a sort of pluralism. There are many ways to participate in God. Some ways are less fortunate, but they are not uh, altogether rejected. For example, I will, I will uh, put an example. The Old Testament sometimes has some notions of God which are less mature or more crude, but this is an analogical participation to God. The Old Testament is not rejected. In the New Testament, we can find a more, a more perfect uh, participation through love. So for instance of time, I will end here and hopefully we can discuss uh, further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Shall we, shall we stop here and move on with the last presentation yes. of the day, perhaps? Yes. So it is uh, my pleasure to present my uh, co-organizer, Professor Arabazis, as the last speaker of today, who will talk to us about Michael Psalos on ideas. And his affiliation, in case you haven't noticed thus far, is of course the National Kapodistrian University of Athens. So please, Yorgo, go ahead. Thank you very much, Eva. I will be very brief because Eva is tired, I think. I'll try to be very brief. We know that the famous and infamous Michael Psellos wrote a short treatise, a kind of introduction to the Platonic theory of ideas. In this text, the second half of which is actually a production of passages from the ninth treaty of the fifth Ennead of Plotinus, the man of letters and Byzantine statesman asserts that about the Platonic ideas, he will not expose its own opinion, but somehow, in the spirit of Plato, he will undertake a more detailed explanation than others. Searching the spirit, the term that Psellos uses to express his interpretive effort is katamandevomenos, one may say guessing in depth. Katamandevome, the verb, has two meanings in antiquity. First, to predict on or against something, to predict about someone. Second, to conjecture about the future. Divinatory practice or science of interpretation, the choice of a philosophy should not, a philosopher should not in principle be in doubt. However, we are entitled to ask if a Byzantine scholar like Psellos was completely free from occult concerns. Of course, the question of divination in Plato is not of minimal importance because of the variety of perspectives that the philosopher embraces in various moments of his thoughts. We know that Plato was against divinatory practices like the searching the, the flight of birds to predict the future. But anyway, references to the term in a more positive sense are not absent from the classical literature and we find in Athenaeus, in the backward of the Sophists, a passage where the author maintains the sense of premonition. But according to another, Panetius of Rhodes speaks about the ease with which the grammarian Aristarchus interpreted, divined, the spirit of poetic creations. Similarly, Aristotle does not despise the word and claims in his rhetoric that it is from the past that we divine the future. And of course, there is the question of theurgy in the Neoplatonic philosophy. It is not surprising that the rational use of the term katamandevomenos in an hermeneutic context, here more or less disappeared from Christian literature since it was attached to practices now condemned. It is then a break, a rupture of the dominant landscapes, landscape when Psellos makes use of it, claim, claiming an intimate Hellenism. What are the real opinions of Psellos is still a conflict matter. We know that in his famous letter to John Xiphilinus, Psellos claims to the orthodoxy of his faith while emphasizing 
the need for a degree of Hellenic including Platonic justice and Aristotelian logic. His official stand is that one must deal with occult matters in order to fortify the Orthodox faith, being thus able to affront the pagan sophistry. So his position is quite different from St. Basil's position about the importance and the value of Greek letters. On the other hand, Pselos, like all members of the Byzantine court and society, never felt cut off from the supernatural. Another indication might be useful. The treaty has the form of a letter to a friend, and this friend could be the patriarch Michael Kerularios. Kerularios. This churchman was well versed in the world and even fell under the influence of an enlightened woman, a sorceress, named Dosithea. He believed that this woman was of divine inspiration. It is possible that Pselos had considered the double meaning of the term and therefore used it with the intention to please a man of high rank, Escherularius. This was a thing that Pselos used to do a lot. He was very close to men of power when they were in power and uh, he deserted them when they were losing their power and deserted them in a very cruel way. In this case, the term refers to the rhetorical virtuosity that was necessary in the Byzantine royal court. And the question of the relation between philosophy and rhetoric in Pselos is a central one. I remind you of the book by, by, by Papa Ioannou, Satis Papa Ioannou, or a philosophy in Pselos. First of all, why Pselos uses Plotinus? He clearly says in his chronography that it is Proclus who offered him science and conceptual precision. The first question would be then why he uses Plotinus to refer to ideas and not For Plotinus, in Enead 5.8, the knowledge of the idea of the beauty is simulation by the beauty, but even more the idea that the knowing subject and the object of the knowledge are identified. Proclus does not admit such an identity in his Platonic theology. And on this point, Pselos seems to agree with Plotinus because in the reproduction of the parts of the Enead 5.9 omits reference to the chapter 7, which specifically speaks of the distinction between thought and object of thought. That distinction is, is to be drastic chapter by Plotinus. Yet the term katamadevomenos makes the distinction quite In addition, Plotinus uses words to describe both the supreme reality and the highest part of the soul thus making this part to be situated beyond sin. This is a doctrine that Proclus explicitly rejected. However, katamadevomenos is also a form of negation in relation to the total grasp of the reality, that means the ideas. We also know that there is a certain confusion between the notions of negation and Plotinus. According to Aristotle's Neoplatonic commentators, the problem arises in terms that shed light on the two traditions, the Peripatetician and the Platonic. For Syrianos, for example, it is above all a question of states of knowledge and not solely about the status of beings. It is therefore an epistemological privation that has nothing to do with the conditions of the beings. Commenting on Aristotle, Syrianos says that the negation appears as a broader concept than that of privation. The failure to grasp the total world of ideas in Pselos, making the katamandevtiki a necessary method, would then be either a privation of the condition of the knowing subject 
or the negation would concern, that would concern the status of the thing to be known in itself. That thing would remain in indefinite state. From this perspective, the use of the katamandevtiki method by Psellos would be the result of a privation in the intellect compared to the acquisition of the definitive knowledge of ideas or a negation of the intellect as a knowing agent. Both mean that the intellect has an indefinite knowledge of ideas. The privation affects the abilities of the knowing subject and therefore the term katamandevomenos does not concern the proper reality of ideas nor the reality of the proper ideas, not undefined in, this, in that aspect which, according to Psellos, comes from above, anothen. The question remains whether this above is hyperousion, superior to being. The Neoplatonic and the Christian thought agree on this point, provided that one leaves aside the problem. This superiority is of the transcendental order, Plotinus says anothen, or supernatural, psellosis anothen. In Proclus, the negation in itself is criticized in relation to the grasping of the beyondness of beings, a position which ends up forming a kind of negation of the negation. Psellos, building upon the authority of Plotanus for the understanding of the problem of ideas, does he mean to recognize in Plotinus a catamadeutic method in general, is the, the philosophy of Plotinus the real uh, way to apprehend ideas? If negation as well as affirmation is negated in the matter of Proclus, and if the intellect is deprived of, is deprived of the full understanding of the world of ideas, then other faculties of the may well be advanced to deal with this problem. And here, Plotinus is necessary. This would be an effort of overinterpretation, a mixture of tradition and innovation, which already characterized the Neoplatonic commentators of Ar Are we to find elsewhere in Psellos' work any evidence as to the distinction mentioned? This is the case of the Epinomis, the pseudo Platonic dialogue, the only work title in the Psellosis chronography. In Epinomis, I'm finishing soon. In Epinomis, we see the hierarchy of sciences ranging from arithmetic to astronomy, which appears to be the noblest of science. Wisdom is piety, and piety is the astronomy. The knowledge of the stars leads to the knowledge of the divinity, in refuting what will lie beyond the intellect and beyond the being. The Epinomis is a work which was explicitly rejected by Proclus. The astral providence which is described in the Epinomis is also refuted by Psellos, who does not accept that the stars influence the course of events produced on Earth and who moreover affirms that the stars are without reason. Thus, his anothen does not concern the stars. One must not forget that in Plotinus, as in the other Neoplatonists, there is a transcendal of the intellect towards the mystical union with the one. The influence of Proclus on the Byzantine philosophy is specially attested in his book, in his work, De Omnifaria Doctrina, where long passages about the intellect are borrowed from the Proclusian elements of theology. For David Jenkins, the continuity of being in Psellos is established through the use of middle logical terms, which he calls mixtures of opposites. There is always an alliance between two terms which are not equal in value. The discursive thought cannot transcend its proper duality. This fact allows the alliance between the noblest philosophy and the less noble rhetoric because the philosophical knowledge alone is only a divisive activity which distances us from the noblest. There are not in Psellos moments of grace 
and the vision of non-discursive truth, like in Plotinus, who saw the one two or three times, as, Porphy as Porphyry says. So there is not such, such, a, uh, such moments in Psellos, but rather the affirmation of the high and noble at the discursive level in a rhetorical and not in an experimental way. The noble may well be represented by power, and the Byzantine emperor appears to be the only one who can resolve the contradictions of knowledge. This is an images, uh, this is an immanence of the noble that furthermore manifests the need for someone who will know how to affirm the transcendental nobility. And this is none other than the philosopher, that is Psellos himself. Psellos, as we know, named himself the consul, the consul of philosophers. The philosopher thus appears as an affirmative force, a model subjectivity in the midst of a universe which to a large, to a large extent remains unknowable. Thank you very much for the attention. We do not hear you, Eva. I'll learn one of these days to unmute first. Uh, thank you very much, George, for your uh, contribution. Please, let's proceed to the questions. Who would like to ask the first question, please? I'll go first to give you some time to think. Now, from all um, that you said, if I got you right, Psellos seems to uh, cling to Plotinus because of, I mean, we do know that Plotinus has been accused of overinterpreting Plato, but would he be attracted to Plotinus because of his tendency, going all the way back to Plato, to articulate the ineffable, even if we agree that it is ineffable. Well, there are many versions of why he turned to Plotinus. Maybe it is an historical process in his uh, in his work. Maybe he started from Proclus in the De Omnifaria Doctrina and later developed. Uh, 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 an affinity with Plotinus. So there is maybe a development, an evolution is here in his thought. Also, I think that uh, for Psellos, uh, Proclus is rather an encyclopedia of fancy. It's a bit dry, isn't it? Yeah. Like it was for many Byzantines. Uh, I mean, the elements of theology is a kind of encyclopedia. But for more. Uh, and I think that Psellos was not very attracted to metaphysics. He thought of Platonic metaphysics as a kind of a monstrous thing. So the, the, the refinement of metaphysics that we find in Proclus would not be so much accepted by, by Psellos. So about the ideas, Plotinus maybe was a better, better solution to have an a very concise and very short idea, uh, view of what the ideas are. And then how the ideas for a Byzantine maybe were not coming from, from Plato only. There are also other, uh, other sources. Moses could be a father of ideas, Zoroaster also. Plato, Plato maybe was a an inheritant, an inheritor of, of traditions, rather than an innovator. Oh, in the way that Clement of Alexandria presents him. Yes. But for Byzantine culture, uh, very often Plato was the, the Greek that took the, the ideas of Moses and made it philosophy. Uh, so, so I think Plotinus was better 
to have a short solution, a short presentation of what the ideas are. But katamandevomenos is for me an enigma. Thank you. I was also struck by the name of Dosithea. Just couldn't but compare her with Diotima. Well, it seems that Kerularius was very close to occultism. The sources say so. And Dosithea was the high priestess of occultism for, uh, for Kerularius. Kilorarius was one of the men that Pselos uh, praised and later uh, abandoned, as he used to do. I think he was a man with a very strange career in letters. And, um, anyone who should approach him feels very attractive to this idea of an immoral subject. For the very first time, we have a philosopher that's not uh, knowledge and virtue, the incarnation of knowledge and virtue. It's the incarnation of knowledge alone. And the virtue is, uh, is deserted in Psalos, by Psalos. Would there be any other question, please? Vasily, yes. Another Australian staying late at night. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, George. Thanks for your. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah thanks for your your insightful uh, talk. Uh, I just want you to comment on the last thing you said, uh, both in your uh, paper and now in the discussion, uh, where you really emphasize the uh, element of the subject and subjectivities. It, uh, it seems, as you said, that the philosopher for the first time in Byzantium uh, becomes a point of reference within a world, a chaotic world, as a subject, a pure subject. How do you think that this uh, fits with the work of uh, Selos in his Chronographia. Could we see, for instance, his chronographia, he's putting together the, the, the events that he puts together in a way that uh, only a philosopher as a pure subject, totally arbitrarily, uh, on his own, in his own power, can do? Well, he comments about the emperor and uh, for the first time, the emperor is not an absolute model. He's someone who is mediocre. And what is important for an imperial subject, and that means not only the emperor, but any subject that would like to be a valid subject, is a form of sociability. It's the first time that we see, because there is a whole literature in, uh, in Byzantium about the, the virtues of the, of the prince. But it's the first time we see, it's, it's a groundbreaking work, that of Psellos in uh, uh, concerning the emperor. He's a mediocre uh, subject. He must be of some morality. He must be of some uh, consequence in uh, behavior and in attitude. But it's not uh, a great subject. What is great about him is the, the way that he guarantees the sociability. And the sociability is precisely the subjects that are interrelated in a way that can be fruitful for the, for the state. Uh, so the new subject that appears in Psellos is very consequential because the imperial subject is, uh, is abandoned in his th political theory. And um, we must not forget that uh, the chronography is a 
historical work, it's very little about works, about wars and the excellence in wars, which is the main subject of all other historians in Byzantium. It's more of a study of character than a study of facts, and of factual reality. That's the first answer that comes to my mind. I hope that is satisfactory. Thank you very much. Now, as George uh, has said, it has been a long day. It is the longest day of all the three in the um, conference. If you have no more questions, or if you do, please email George and the other speakers um, and resolve your um, questions over the email. But I think it's time for us to bring this second day to a closure. And renew our appointment for tomorrow, the last day uh, of the conference, with two keynote speeches and a few more papers. So thank you very much for your attention and your patience uh, with us today. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So I'm ending the, the meeting for all of you. Thank you.